it happened? I started researching 16 years ago. <laughs> and I'm left to conclude once again what I knew all along that the only way out is in. Well, that's certainly true. There's only one thing left to do. What do I do? What do I do? It's up to me to come to you. So that's what I'm doing now. I'm here to tell you about the bar. Well, he had to really, didn't he? You got me where you want me, I surrender. The sheer weight of evidence against the Stratford man is insurmountable, and so here we are, every other Sunday, removing the mask and revealing to you the deepest, most amazing secrets behind this brilliant subterfuge. Tune in or tune out. It's up to you. Streaming live on Facebook Barcode later today at 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. To be or not to be there? There's <laughs> no question. Good day, everybody, and welcome. To podcast episode three in a continuing series of 624 podcasts, God willing. It's September 20, year 2020, of the famously improved, but still slightly off Gregorian calendar. Each day of the year has a unique Shakespeare sonnet number connected to it, and I shall explain how that works today for sure. Today's is sonnet 109, which starts... Oh, never say that I was false of heart. Today, we will be seeing just how deeply the writer poured his heart out and all his universe of love to us all. Welcome. Podcast one and two had um, special guests, Michael Delahoyt and Michael Dunn, and then Jamie Janover. Today's special guest is you because the format is going to change alternately. Sometimes we'll have special guests. Sometimes it'll just be a master class um, of me showing you basically the stuff you really need to fully understand in order to most appreciate the incredible codes that this writer, whoever he, she, they, it was, has left for us. So in this case, today is going to be a masterclass in just catching you up on some of the basics. And I want to explain why. When I started doing this, well, 16 years ago, but once I had it uh, up to speed where I felt I had something to deliver, which was maybe after about four years of uh, de coding and other things, I realized when I give a presentation, if I give an hour's presentation to 100 or 200 people and they love it, and I maybe a month later I'd give another hour's presentation, it would be a different group of people. And I'd want to be giving new information, but I'd be constrained to not be able to because there ha you had to have a certain understanding of the basics before one could escalate to and look now and look now and then he did this and then he did that and so each time i'd have to do a catch-up maybe 20 minutes of oh the previous stuff so that you understand it and i'd do a very quickly encapsulated version of that and then i'd really only have 40 minutes in which to give new information and some of those people were new and so they didn't really get a good glimpse of what the first part was by the time i'm doing a third presentation i'd have to encapsulate the first two down to half an hour and I only have half an hour. So it left to do new stuff. So it became clear early on that this was an impossible situation to be able to deliver without it being a, a weekend seminar, say, at least, where you had time to, ah, got that. Let's have a break and have lunch. Now let me give you this. Ah, got that. And if everybody had all that knowledge, 
of the basics at first, then everything else that comes after it is much more comprehensible and much more enjoyable because you get it. It's, oh yeah, um, wow, I see that. Oh, that refers back to that. So really the purpose of now giving master classes in this format is obviously they'll all be archived onto our website to be or not to be dot org. They'll also be archived on the YouTube channel, Bard Code. And I guess momentarily they'll be on Facebook immediately after we've done it, but those get kind of lost as we've seen and we've been learning as we went along. Oh, they're gone. History. So Facebook is not the place for archiving it. So if you're not able to fully grasp all of it in one session, you can go back and, and, and look at it again, obviously all archived. So that's the idea so that we can kick off in future broadcasts really giving you utterly new material that I've never really spoken about because in the old days, and I'm talking now back around about 2010 onwards, so for 10 years, what I've been doing is getting new stuff, New downloads come in all the time. You go, oh my God, yeah, look at that. Da, 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 da. Found it. Mm -hmm. And then you end up with, I can't really post that on YouTube because again, of the situation I just explained to you, we don't fully understand all the basics. And so what I would do was I would put a, a video up of the new finding on YouTube, unlisted, and just leave it there. So consequently, <laughs> I'm now drawing back the veil of years of stuff there. Uh, and it's great because it's already mostly been done, though, of course, new material comes in and then you have to, oh, I'm going to reshape that because I didn't realize, I didn't quite know this part yet. So it's all perfect. It's all wonderful that I've, I've ended up on this long journey. And now looking back on it, I can pull out all the best, most juicy parts put them in order and have you see them uh, and, 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 and at your heart's content over and over and over. So that's the idea with today that I will be giving you pretty much what's in the, the first book, Decoding Shakespeare. Um, and obviously since this book is not widely known, I have, I have sold a lot. I've sold about 13 copies. And so, uh, you know, it's getting exposure. <laughs> it's not true, but honestly, I've given away more copies than I've sold because that was never the purpose anyway. The purpose was to document it so that it would be a permanent record. So now, um, now we are beginning to sell a lot of books, thankfully, but you get a chance today another person gets a chance to win one. So that is um, on the agenda for today. And how that works is if you were tuned on to the first one and two podcasts, you know that I'm going to somewhere in the whole presentation today, there'll be a, a nugget of information that I will then towards the end or maybe two thirds of the way through, I will ask a question. Were you paying attention? What's the answer to this question? And the first person to comment the answer, Alejandro, my helper here is going to be on, on track watching everybody's comments and say, okay, so-and-so got it. He'll slip me the name and that person will win a signed book. And we'll send it out to you as quickly as possible by pigeon. So, uh, and I would ask, by the way, the la last, the last winner was Drew Sipe, last podcast, and we didn't, we forgot to ask him to take a fi take a picture with his book so that we could post it on our website. That'd be nice if Drew, Drew, if you're on, please do that. Just take a quick selfie with the book and we'll, we'll have a, a catalog of all the winners on the site and send it into us. If not, we'll be sending you out a note on that anyway. So, 
Um, got it clear? That's the format. Sometimes we'll have special guests and that will be just a, a wonderful sort of conversation like the, the two that you've seen already back and forth uh, with a lot of anecdotes and stuff. Next podcast number four coming up is going to be the wonderful I don't even know how to describe this person, Adam Apollo. Um, he's just a, a wonderful polymath, well-versed in things that are way, way, way beyond my understanding of quantum mechanics. He's, he's out there. Uh, he's a young guy. He's fabulous. We, we were on a, on a trip to Egypt together and uh, Adam is, is hilarious, but also the, one of the deepest people I know, and you're going to love that. So that's October 4th, broadcast number four coming up. We were supposed to have, I announced last time, Robert Edward Grant would be on this time. And the reason uh, we changed that schedule was because you may have noticed that the, this format on Facebook, it seemed a bit glitchy whenever I played a video that on my keynote, when we saw the recording of it afterwards, uh, the audio was pretty glitchy. I don't know what that was, whether it's on Facebook's side or our side, but in the meantime, we've upgraded our uh, internet connection considerably, so probably that's it. Uh, but also we've we've upgraded all of our equipment to be able to bring you really, really professional sort of news broadcast editing. And because of that, we thought, well, let's save Robert's presentation until we've got that up to speed because there's a bit of a learning curve involved in, in using it. And so we, we know that Robert's talk is going to have a lot of graphics. He always does. I always do too. Uh, but it, it, <laughs> the two of us together, it's a bit of a smorgasbord of, oh, let me show you this. No, let me show you that. And we want it to be pre presented in the best possible way. So that will be coming up. I should imagine it'll be uh, bef before the end of October. It'll probably be the one after Adam Apollo. But we haven't quite set that yet. We just want to make sure all our ducks are in, in a row. So I'm going to say, without any further ado, that that question is coming somewhere. So stay tuned. In the meantime, also, please, since there's no special guest, the special guest is, is you. Uh, I want you to treat this as though you're literally here uh, we are here, you know, in a room together and you can just say, oh, Alan, what about so-and-so? Please ask questions. Um, and Alejandro will be taking care of that in the background. Um, that was him falling over the boxes that we just heard. And we'll be uh, sending for a medic. Oh, no, he's all right. So, you good? Okay, good. Everything's smooth. <laughs> all right. So, but treat it just like that. Alejandro will be checking the comments. Somebody has a question, I want to try and answer it on the spot. So just, just, just be casual about that. No question is too, uh, too simple or uh, unimportant because this is deep stuff. And I really want you to all get it and understand it as deeply as, as as I have over 16 years, right? So over 16 years, of course, I, I, I can say with absolute certainty, it's the greatest joy. You'll, you'll, you'll get great joy from fully grokking this, getting, oh my God, look at that. So let's start then, uh, I guess as I switch to share screen, what's gonna happen is you're gonna see my, oh, he's fallen over again. So, um, no, oh, he's all right. All right, so we will continue. I'm go when I share screen, uh, you're going to see my keynote briefly, I think, and then I'm going to essentially, let's see if I can do this. Got it.
There we go. I knew that would be on. That one's on. Okay. All right. So starting as near as possible at what I would call the beginning, or at least the, what was the beginning for me. We're dealing here with a master, an avatar-like being, who truly is beyond our comprehension. Now, that might sound like an enormous exaggeration. Is he really on, an, on a par with an Einstein or uh, any of the other greats in physics? Well, <laughs> I would say yes, unequivocally so, and even greater because his mind was ex so expansive that he, we know him as the great writer. We don't know him as this great uh, mathematician and geometer, but he's, he's, he's that as well. So here's me at the grand piano in Holy Trinity Church in, well, I went there several times, so uh, this precise date I'm not sure of. Um, I think it was the dress rehearsal for the time that I scanned the altar. I'm going to give you the layout. Right behind the piano there is Shakespeare's gravestone. But I shall be referring to the man from Stratford as Shakespeare, just for clarity. Because Shakespeare is the writer, but the man from Stratford who is supposedly buried there was baptized Guglielmus Shakespeare, and he spelt his name with a hard A-K, never with an E after it. But again, even that is very iffy because there are only six extant signatures. They're all um, spelled differently. They all look like they were written by different hands. Even handwriting experts cannot agree that they're all done by the same person. So that's part of the mystery too. But anyway, Shakespeare helps us delineate. Oh, that's the man from Stratford who we've all been taught at school is the writer Shakespeare. This is his gravestone. There's no name Shakespeare or Shakespeare on it. The only name on it is Jesus. And it is a code. It's pretty bad poetry. It's widely regarded as the worst possible epitaph for the greatest ever writer. And people argue, well, did he write this? Good friend, for Jesus' sake, forbear to dig the dust and goes a dear, blessed be a man that spares these stones and cursed be he that moves my bones. Doesn't really sound like Hamlet. Anyway, that's his gravestone. Here above my head is the monument and that's a different thing altogether and it too is a code a part of it is in latin bad latin at the top not that anybody in stratford would have been able to read or understand latin at the time but even the english is bad and clearly an encryption once you you get the idea of it it's also got the date at the bottom, obit annual deo 1616, says he was 53. He wasn't, he was 52. So that's a part of the mystery as well. So that's the monument. Then back of me here, about 12 feet away, is the Holy of Holies altar stone, which disappeared long before Shakespeare's time. It probably disappeared around about 1535 during the Reformation when Henry VIII decided that he wanted to marry Anne Boleyn and so he wanted to get a divorce and uh, the church wouldn't let him and so he said okay in that case I'm going to have a huff. <laughs> I'm going to just change our religion. We're not going to be Catholics anymore. We're going to be Protestants. The whole of England had to suddenly change their religion and became known as the Reformation. And at that time, there was a lot of hacking of, of anything that had anything to do with the old religion, Christ on it, or as the Holy of Holies altar stone has, 
stigmata wounds of Christ on the surface. So they, some of them were hacked off. You can see it now in its present state, now that we have it back. But it disappeared, and we know it went on into the uh, underground of the church down in the catacombs. And it was gone and just wasn't there at all during Shakespeare's time and was only found again in 1879 uh, or 89. I must get that correct. So now it's back where it should be, but that's why I've colored it black. Nobody knew where it was. Nobody knew that it was a part of the, of the subterfuge, the encoding. There's how it looks today. Okay, there's a banner that I put up in front of it so that you couldn't see what we were doing behind it whilst I sang songs, but I'm getting ahead of myself. We have to go back in order to fully understand what's going on to Moses on Mount Sinai. So Moses on, is on Sinai and he sees God from the burning bush and God announces his name to him because Moses asks him, who shall I say sent me? They're never going to believe me coming down the mountain with uh, these tablets. Uh, you know, give me your name. God says, Echye Asher Echye, which is commonly translated as I am that I am. Or other translations are I will be what I will be, or I was what I was. In other words, it's all present past and future tense of the verb to be which is makes sense that's you know existence be godness i'm i'm everything that there is ever has been and ever will be but for our purposes the most common is i am that i am and so taking that phrase in hebrew it begins with three alephs and so, of course, they are read backwards, right to left. And those three Alephs, those are the first letters of the Hebrew alphabet. We turn the alphabet backwards so that it starts at the left. Then the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet is the Tav, equivalent of the Greek Tau, or the English letter T. And so a very common, simple cipher predating all of this stuff, going way back into, or almost into untraceable history, is the triple tau, T, T, T. In other words, the Aleph, Aleph, Aleph becomes Tav, Tav, Tav. The Greek equivalent is Tau, 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 and that is three Ts, and it is known as the triple tau, and it was adopted by probably used by the Templars, certainly used by the Rosicrucians, then moved on to today's modern day Freemasons. Triple Tau. It means I am that I am, but it is a, a formative part of sp specifically Royal Arch Freemasonry. And it represents many things. It, it is a stand in for the three crosses on Calvary. But we know that Christ and the two thieves were not crucified like this. They were on basically tau crosses, much cheaper for the Romans to do, just basically two pieces of wood. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't fancy. So it really was three tau symbols. And so deciding that that should mean tau, 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 the name of God, a sort of a secret nudge, nudge, wink, wink, I'm in the club, are you? they also turned it into a symbol of three T's joined together at the base like this. There's one on the left, one on the right, and one on the top. And so it looks like a TH. And that is known as the triple tau. And it has to the initiates of Freemasonry, three specific meanings, all to do with TH. The Latin is clavis ad thesaurum, means keys to the treasure. Theca will be res pretiosa de Ponitur, of course, as we all know, means place where the precious thing is concealed. <laughs> and templum hierosolima 
Solomon's temple, first temple of Jerusalem. So it has these three hidden meanings within the symbol itself, as well as having the meaning of I am that I am, as well as having the meaning of the three crosses at Calvary. So can any of you see a triple tau in the gravestone? It is not encoded three T's. They're right there in the middle. They form the basis of the what's called the stipes of the cross of a T. And it's right there with Jesus' name across the top forming what's called the patibulum. And that's it. It's right there. It's not even hidden. Tau, tau, tau. Now, are there any THs? Yeah, there's one here, but you notice it's not a TH. It's ligature. In, in printing, we call ligatured. It's they're hooked together. So it's a T and it's an H, but they each have a common stem called a digraph, a ligatured component in printing. And there's one here. So there's a clue, keys to the treasure, place where the precious thing is concealed. Interesting. Are there any such THs in the monument? It's amazing, you can look at this for years, as I did, and, then you, and just glance through it and never really make the connection if you're not attuned to look for it. If I guess you're not an initiate into the secret society that understands the symbolism. So this was clearly left for those initiates, but yeah, there are a lot of THs there, and every single one of them is a ligature TH saying, I am that I am. No way. Yeah. So, and you notice that they are grouped together so that you can kind of isolate them into a, a group of four and a group of six. And in the middle, there's another couple of ligatures. But these are, again, unknown in printing, Generally, these are M, E. M and E ligature together. What is this really saying? There's four of those, there's two of those, and there's six of those, if you're reading left to right. But if you're reading right to left, Hebraic fashion, of course, it's six to four. I am that I am me. Okay. Right to left, it would read that. And I say right to left because, of course, there's so much he Hebraic uh, foundation in this. It starts with that Atbash cipher that gives us the triple tau. And so it's not at all unusual to think there's a, there is a Hebraic connection in this because it's based on that. So it's both 4, 2, 6, and it's 6, 2, 4. And it's very, very clear. Now, we're going to look at the cover of the sonnets. And those of you who have seen some information, this is information I'm not going to give again today because I've pretty much given it in, in, in the first couple of podcasts anyway, where I show the geometry on the title page of the sonnets. But you can find that if you haven't already seen it, go to the website and look up Bard Code um, Sonnets. I think it's just called Bard Code Sonnets. Anyway, do a search for that. Even if you don't do the website, just look up barcode sonnets and my name, Alan Green, and you'll find it online on YouTube, in which there's hidden geometry. But we're not going to go into that today because that's pretty well known. I think most people have seen that. We turn the page and there's a dedication, which again is utterly cryptic. There's a dot between each word it doesn't make sense if you just read it linearly, left to right. But it is grouped in three shapes of inverted triangles. And there's a six lines and two lines and four lines. There's that pattern again, six, two, four. Now, I always want to give credit 
uh, to the people that started me off on this path. One was a man named John Rollett, who was the first person to notice this. He saw that there was six and two and four lines in inverted triangles and dots between every word. And he, so he just thought, I wonder if we're supposed to count the dots. So he, the sixth word is these, the second is sonnets. So it goes six, two, four, six, two, four, six, two. And it takes you all the way through and it says these sonnets all by ever, the fourth T. And at the time, this was around about 2000, he thought he'd found something very significant and gave a paper about it and said, well, you know, the leading candidate at that time uh, was Edward de Vere, the 17th Earl of Oxford, leading alternate candidate to be the, the true Shakespeare. Um, it had been Bacon for, for a long, long, long time. And then Edward de Vere was sort of in the ascendancy and people were doing a lot of work studying him and had been for the past eight years prior to then. In fact, this year, 2020, is the 100th anniversary of a book that came out by J. Thomas Loney called Shakespeare uh, Identified in the 17th Earl of Oxford. Edward de Vere. And so that movement is known as the Oxfordian movement. The prior movement major was Baconian. But he thought, well, perhaps E. Vere is a little play on the word Vere, or even de Vere himself sometimes just did a play on his own name with Ever anyway. And so it, maybe it's these sonnets all by E. Veer, Edward Veer, or just Veer. But Rollett could not figure what the fourth T meant. And he did not make any connection further. Uh, there was a lot of brouhaha at the time. Well, Edward de Veer's name is six letters, two letters, four letters. Ah, oh, this is pretty promising. Maybe this is finally the smoking gun that proves who Shakespeare was. Was it Edward de Vere? So it's pretty exciting to those people in that group, Oxfordians. I was not even on the trail yet. I didn't even join the party until about 2004. So there's that. And then we carry on. We're going to now show the, there's the, the geometrical key on the cover what I told you we're not going to go into today, then the dedication page holds a numerical key, which essentially shows, uh, that's what this entire book is about, uh, is delving into the depth of that code. So I'm going to try and cover most of it today. Clavis ad fessorum, keys to the treasure. Uh, okay, well, there's perhaps a poetical key as well in the sonnets themselves, because then you, you end up here, and I'm going through them very, very quickly to show you what it really means to have all these pages of sonnets. In fact, I've cut some of them out just to get to the end very, very quickly. But there's 154 sonnets. And it occurred to me that essentially the main message in the sonnets, though there are many, sub-levels to this, but essentially they're all about time. They're about contrasting uh, earthly, temporal time with heavenly or spiritual, ephemeral, eternal time. He's always contrasting these ideas of, of oh, you've got to hurry up, you've only got a very short life, but life is eternal after this. And I thought, you know, Perhaps then, if you overlaid the sonnets on a 365 day calendar, perhaps it's a map, perhaps it's a way of marking time. But of course, there's only 154 sonnets. So this would mean sonnet one is January one, go sonnet 32 is February one, sonnet 60 is March one, etc. And you go through here and you get to here 
and you, you've ended, you've got 154 sonnets. If this is his method for delivering a message through the sonnets, he would simply have to flow them through again. So 154 then ends on November 4th, and starting here, he'd flow again to the end of the year. And now he's got a map. If, if anything wants to be said about a certain event on a certain date, it has a sonnet number attached to it. Now, this was just an idea out of left field. No one had ever sort of thought to, to, to map it in this way. But I kind of made it uh, my... Uh, mission to try to see was this true or not because I had seen correspondences that certainly looked very very interesting for instance what dates would be important to Shakespeare at all well the Queen's birth uh, the Queen's death the Queen's funeral and there are the dates so now you dissolve into the map and you see there are certain sonnets associated with those dates. And the one in red, of course, he can give something for the Queen's birth on September 7th, because there's a whole new round of the sonnets that allows him to place, oh, I'm gonna put it in that sonnet. And when you read those sonnets then with that new perspective, I'm not gonna go into it because it's, it's, that gets lengthy, but you realize, oh yeah, it certainly looks like he's giving strong clues that that's what the sonnet partially is about. You can never nail him down and say, oh, it's what it's only about. But this is certainly, you see very, very distinct clues in some of these that say, oh yeah, well look, he's talking about a queen there. He's talking about uh, the death of a monarchy. So he does this all over the place. I decided to look into Edward de Vere's own children that were, we, we know the dates when they were born. And, and if you then look at the corresponding sonnets, it's kind of heartbreaking. Some of them are very, very obvious. Some are a, a little more hidden and, and you might say maybe a bit of a stretch until you realize from other um, proofs that this really is, this is what he's doing, absolutely. Um, and I can prove it in a couple of ways. I'm going to look at specifically the sonnets to do with certain dates that I'm interested in because, well, you'll see why. So here's sonnet 116. It's the only, I started with this one because it's the only sonnet that is misnumbered. The sonnets go from 114 to 115 to 119 to 117. Obviously, this should be 116, but you turn that six around into a nine to give you, what, 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 is that just a printing error? Well, at this time, I'd already been on the hunt for codes. I'd already discovered John Dee's own involvement in it. I'd seen him do this many times, inverting a six and a nine to give certain meaning. So it was pretty clear. But of course, to you yet, that does not make total sense, but it, it will in a minute, but you have to kind of approach it from this direction. What does he say about it? Does, does he give us any other clues other than that idea of six and nine being a perfect inversion that represents the, the, the symbol for cancer? Well, at the end of the sonnet, he says, if this be error and upon me proved, I never writ, nor no man ever loved. It's actually telling you that this is not an error. If it's not an error, it's then deliberate, isn't it? Oh, a deliberate mistake to draw your attention to it. Okay, so now we realize that's a system he's using because if 116, what it should be, is actually the date it applies to is April 26. April 26 is the date of the baptism of Shakespeare. And it even has three crosses by it, which 
every scholar on the Stratfordian side of things and the Orthodox says, well, yeah, th that was his parents and a witness's signature. <laughs> and on one level, that might be right, although it's not the best thing to, to publicize if you're trying to say, this is the greatest writer in the world. And his mom and dad were illiterate. And, and they were, we know they were, but then that wasn't unusual for Stratford anyway. Most people were. And so a neighbor chimed in as well. Oh, sure, I'll put my ex there. So, I mean, it could be that. But on the other hand, it just might be this, <laughs> mightn't it? It might be three crosses. So, just a little, I'm just saying. So, April 26, here's your sonnet again. And it says in that sonnet, oh no, it is an ever fixed mark, fixed mark. It's been fixed. In fact, it says an ever fixed mark. Well, evir. That word again, these sons all by ever. All right, well, Alan, maybe you're right, maybe you're wrong. You've got to do better than that. I mean, that's just one word, fixed. How do you know it means anything? I look for him using the word fixed in any other sonnet. And he only uses it in three sonnets. And whenever he uses a word only three times, I've learned to realize and that, oh, that is significant because it's it, <laughs> simply because it always is. He's always telling us something if he uses a particular word only three times. And he, these are the three sonnets in which he uses that word fixed. Well, S, O, L are the leading letters of these three sonnets. Sol. Sol meaning the sun or shortened for the solstice, sol sistere, the sun stands still, is where, from where we get the, the word, the solstice. The markers of time on the calendar when we switch from one particular season to another, and then the other two, besides the solstices, also separated by three months each, are the equinoxes when time is equal night, equinox. When the solstice is when it's the longest day in say the Northern Hemisphere or the longest day in the Southern Hemisphere because the Earth is doing this. All right, so sol, maybe that's a clue. Let's look at this particular fixed, we've run there we've done Shakespeare's baptism is four two six. Well, doesn't that ring a bell? As well as the idea that it was wrongly numbered, it should at four two six. We saw it on the monument. This is sonnet twenty one that has the word fixed in it. So twenty one here in the second go round of the sonnets is June twenty fourth. And June 24th is the opposite of 426, that's 624. Certainly looks like we're getting somewhere here, doesn't it? Remember, 426 or 624. So what is 624 about? Well, 624, June 24th, in the old pagan calendar, that was the celebration of the summer solstice during the 16th century. It was known as Midsummer's Day. We know now in our modern world that it occurs on the 21st and the 22nd of June, not just because it's shifted minutely, it's that back then the calendars were all out of whack. We were on the old Julian calendar. It was gradually slipping out of whack. It was off for farmers. It was off for the church. They couldn't predict accurately when Easter was going to happen. And Pope Gregory decided to introduce his Gregorian calendar and put everything right. Um, and he shifted everything by 10 days. And if we have enough time, we'll get into that at some point. So, it's the old calendar that everyone was using during Shakespeare's time that 
Midsummer's Day was June 24th, and Midsummer's Night was Midsummer's Eve, the 23rd, the cusp of those two dates. It's also the cusp then of the passing over from Gemini into Cancer. Well, Cancer has that 6 9 symbol. His Royal Arch Freemasonry's symbol of the keystone being at that point there, the keystone, the central, one of the central figures and icons of their whole idea of symbolism, 6 9. It's that point of cusp of a solstice. There it is again. 69116 is written as 119 sonnet. It's also the feast of St. John the Baptist, who is the patron saint of Freemasons. Ah, so now we're really getting somewhere. And on the cusp of the solstice, midsummer's night, June 23rd, June 24th, Edward de Vere, 17th Earl of Oxford, disappeared. Now, history says he died. But there's no record of anyone ever writing anything about it. He was the Lord Great Chamberlain of England, leading nobleman of the country, the an extremely prominent, well-known figure. There should have been eulogies and parades and mourning and outpourings of grief on a national holiday. It ne that never happened. Nothing happened. It's as though it just didn't happen. No one at court wrote a letter to anybody saying, oh, pity old Ed's gone. You know, it's, <laughs> it's very clear that perhaps, let's just say perhaps at this point, this is a code. That this is a, a setup that it's, dare I say, fixed. 624 and 426 are two sonnets that have the word fixed in them, and the 624 is the solstice, and the sonnets that have the word fixed are S O L, and on and on and on and on, and the monument says 426624. So at this point, I knew I was onto something something very, very significant. John Rollett, who had thought of the 624 in the very first place, just left it nowhere. He couldn't, he could not take it to the next step and say what the fourth T meant. And so he abandoned his uh, thesis at the time and just said, no, 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 I was mistaken. And, and, and no one much took it any further at all until I uh, came along in 2004 and, and stood on those shoulders. And then from everything from then on that you're going to see is basically the work that derived from that. So we've got these two dates, right? One is Edward de Vere, fixed. One is William Shakespeare, fixed. So, Let's just mark that in the calendar, 624 and 426 opposites. What about 101? Why is it fixed? Well, it's to do with the solstice. <laughs> Here's the Great Pyramid. And this is a picture of it taken from the air in 1937 uh, by an RAF pilot who just happened to catch a photograph of it right at, this was actually the equinox, but of course they're all intertied completely, um, it shows a shadow on the side of the Great Pyramid. That, but it's only visible even for about 12 seconds. And he just happened to be lucky and just catch it flying over. As Ra, the sun god, moves, the shadow moves, and now you don't see that, that there's actually an indent in the Great Pyramid. And we're looking at the inner core, by the way, because all the outer beautiful white Tura limestone is now gone. So whether that was indented or not, we don't really know. Uh, there's no indication that it was. So why would they hide this on the internal structure? But now we know, full, you know, you can look it up online, there's an indent in the Great Pyramid. I've gone there myself and measured it very accurately uh, because I believe there's deep mathematics hidden within that. So, okay. Why 101? Uh, I'm not going into it in great detail here because, again, it, there's so much. I will cover that in a later master class. But essentially, there are 201 courses on the Great Pyramid. So the absolute center is 
101, with 100 courses above it and 100 courses below it. 101, Sonnet 101, and that's the center that has specific meaning once you apply the rest of the code to it. So he's telling us even there to look at the Great Pyramid. And again, those of you who've looked at the Bard Code Sonnets, you know that the essential uh, coup de grace of that whole thing is right at the end. He's given us the, the geographic coordinates of the Great Pyramid. This is now John D, because we have to move along into his, his place in all of this. John D. This is something that was channeled to him by angels and became known as the Enochian Tables. Wow, angels. Okay, he had to hide this, of course. I mean, he didn't hide it entirely, but he did find out pretty quickly that he, as he started to talk about it on the continent, uh, he, he was in danger of, of being, um, if, not for, if not killed, forcibly removed. Because the church didn't want to hear about angels. They didn't want to hear about talking to angels. But he was a very pious man. He actually believed that he could bring about a reconciliation between the Catholics and the Protestants. The whole reformist movement that was happening to, to break away from the Catholics that started the Thirty Years' War in Europe, which is... I cover deeply on uh, the new stuff on the website, the Fisher Kings series, which I highly uh, hope you'll get into. You don't absolutely need to understand all this to get into that. That kind of stands on its own. So here's John Dee in Europe talking to angels. He was communicating with angels for eight years. He himself was not clairvoyant. He needed a psychic, what they called back then a scryer, and his name was Edward Kelly. And Kelly and he did these angel communications, highly secret, kept records of them in John Dee's diaries. So we know that this table was channeled to him by angels. And in his own writing here, we see there are 624 characters in four windows. And you begin to I mean, I began to say, what? <laughs> okay, I think this might be something to do with all the rest of the stuff that I've found. And then I look in his diaries and I found it was channeled to him by angels on June 24, 1584. In fact, well, at least that's when it started. The whole session lasted from June 24th across possibly, certainly through 25th and possibly into June 26th. They gave him a warning on June 24th to prepare and fast and pray and be ready. And, and once we started, they started it uh, while it was still June 24th on a portion of the earth and it went through a great length. And these letters were being delivered to the scryer, Edward Kelly, in flame, 60 foot high. He would see a letter and he say to John Dee, put this letter in. And the angels were telling him how to draw the grid and how to map it out. And imagine the, the work involved. But this happened on 624 and they give him 624 characters. So by this stage, I'm just going, okay. I mean, I know, I have no idea how this is going to connect, but obviously this 624 is connected to the encoding that I've seen here in the science dedication, the 624. So you add up all the characters, just all the letters and all the dots, and it's 178. The monument, this is this has its THs in it, remember? It's got the, the secret coded letters. Oh, add up all the characters and the punctuation in the monument, 332. Add up all the characters and the punctuation in the gravestone. 114. Anybody have a wild guess what this might add up to? Any comments coming in? <laughs> oh, yeah. So obviously, At this point, 
you've got to just say, all right, what could be more clear? The silence dedication makes no sense. The monument makes no sense. The gravestone makes no sense. They are codes. You must put them into a grid and presumably the grid you're supposed to put them into is this grid that I just showed you, the Enochian tables. And I could go into that in great detail and show it to you. Uh, but again, in order to get a lot, get through a lot, I will save that for a later um, presentation and a later masterclass because I can show you quickly where it, where it leads without it disturbing your understanding of the whole situation of this. But it is fascinating to see it. But again, uh, we'll save that for another masterclass because we will go into deep dives into precisely <laughs> what else is hidden in there. But the basic main thing that's hidden is what I want to get across to you right now. Enochian tables, clavis at thesaurum, keys to the treasure. And here's the sonnet's dedication and the monument and the gravestone put into the exact same grid. And all you need to know is the key, you know, because these letters are going to point across into the Enochian tables. Well, the key is that this was written, presumably, the science dedication, by someone named Thomas Thorpe, who was supposedly the publisher. But all of that is a subterfuge, because Thomas Thorpe spells his name Thomas Thorpe, T-H-T-H. -T -H. And in a later um, dedication that he gives a year later, he signs his name T-H-T-H. -T -H. Well, what does T-H mean? T-H is the secret symbol, isn't it? That's the key to the treasure. That's the clavis ad thesaurum. That's the symbol. That's the I am that I am. That's the secret handshake and nudge, nudge, wink, wink of the Freemasons and the Rosicrucians back then. Oh, so when it was signed THTH, that was clear. In the sonnets, he signs TT. So I made the deduction that, oh, okay, it, that must be the key, the TT. And how you then manage to find what this is pointing to is that when you put all of those into a grid that mimics precisely exactly the Enochian tables, you see now I've, there's a spreadsheet where I've put in all that you saw, the sonnet's dedication, the monument, and the gravestone. Down to the last dot, pink. It's just perfect. 624 characters but I've outlined in pink the double T's, the, the TT sonnets uh, signature of Thomas Thorpe, and then there are another four sets of double T's. So there's five sets of double T's altogether, and they point across into the Enochian tables. So they point to certain letters, don't they? And you set those letters aside. It's very simple, very clean. It's called ciphertext, plain text. So you get a message. But Here's the brilliance of it that is utterly unheard of in cryptography, that the key is in, in the other part of the encoding as well. In other words, this top part is called the ciphertext because it's hidden. It's what you see, but it, it, it's not telling you anything direct. The plain text is down below in the Enochian tables, which gives you the message that you can understand. But to turn it around and make plain text become the ciphertext and the ciphertext become the plain text means, oh, there are five sets of double T's here in the Enochian tables. And they point back to the original <laughs> sonnets, monument, gravestone. Imagine the work that's gone into this to say, okay, these T's, T's are going to point back and they are going to hit certain letters in what has been written by humans, we presume. Somebody wrote the sonnet's dedication and the gravestone and the monument. I believe it was John Dee. But the other part was written by angels. Okay. Imagine having to wrap your head around this and be channeling this and saying, okay, I'm going yeah, to write something that, that maps to your Enochian tables because you've, you've channeled this to me on 624 with 624 characters. So it's pretty mind boggling, but that gives you a message too. But now, impossible to even fathom, 
turn it upside down. Now, why do we turn it upside down? Because <laughs> in Twelfth Night, there is a scene where Malvolio, we see him here, but with Shakespeare's head on him, dressed in uh, yellow stockings and red garters. It's a, it's a joke scene in Twelfth Night where he is being misled and Maria drops a letter down on the floor, on the, on, on the ground rather, out in the garden where he's walking and he picks it up and he, he's obviously curious and he looks and he decides he's going to read it. He thinks he's not being watched and he reads the thing and it, it says, M-O-A-I doth sway my life. And later on, if this fall into thy hands, revolve. Well, again, that needs a very, very deep explanation, but I wanted to get to the point where you can understand this. So you don't need the deep explanation on this, just, oh, he's given a clue. He's given something that says, M-O-A-I does sway my life. And he's trying to figure it out. It's a code in the play that is never solved in the play. It's been put in for our benefit, for the audience or the reader to realize, wait a minute, that seemed like a, a non sequitur. It, it went nowhere in the play. What's that about? And then he gives us a clue. If this fall into the hand revolve. So when you revolve M-O-A-I, you get I-A-O-M, and that just happens to be the Freemasons' most secret, sacred password in all of their initiatory procedures. And again, I'll give a much longer talk on that at some time. But the, the cleverness of the clue is in saying revolve. So having got this far, I've got the message. I'm not revealing the message to you yet, but I know what the message says. And I'm going, oh my God, he's, he's telling us something very, very clear. But, what, but it was sort of incomplete revolve maybe you revolve the entire grid of the Enochian tables and now the the double t's in the cipher text and plain text are pointing to other letters than they were pointing to originally and that gives you another message message three and then the double t's there point back and they give you another message it's utterly mind-boggling but more mind-boggling is the fact that it actually makes sense. And it says, living page, Yostigmata, I have hewn desiderata. And 1889, when that was actually found again under the soil in Holy Trinity Church not down in the catacombs. When it was found, it was actually where it would easily be found. It was just six inches below the flagstones when they eventually were renovating the church. And then it was found, they went, oh, here's our older stone. It's been missing since, ooh, what? Uh, wow, oh, 300 and odd years. So here's the message. It says, living page. Your stigmata, I have hewn desiderata. Not only is it a message, it's in rhyming, it's a rhyming couplet in Shakespearean form of tetrameter. Living page, your stigmata, I have hewn desiderata. I mean, okay, well, living page means there's a page, a document kept alive, right? Kept preserved somehow. Yo, stigmata. Yo, in those days, was a Middle English term. It was not yo. It wasn't. <laughs> it was not part of a rap song. It was. It had a very, very, very specific meaning. Yo meant look at, but not just look at casually. It meant really pay attention to. That's what yo meant. Stigmata. Really pay attention to the stigmata. What are the stigmata? Those are Christ's wounds on the cross at Calvary, right? The triple tau. Oh, where are the stigmata then? It, 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 wait a minute. This is all pointing to the altar, is it? Um, 
or at least the church, yeah, I mean, stigmata, where are the stigmata in the church? They're only one place. They're on the altar stone. The Holy of Holies altar stone. That's where there must be five incised crosses, four, one in each corner, and one in the middle. They signify the stigmata wounds of Christ. Two nails in the hands, two in the feet, and the spear in the side that pierced his side to make sure he was dead. That then brought forth water as well as blood, which then the Catholics turn into the mystery of mass at the Holy of Holies altar stone. You take, partake of the body of Christ, the bread, and the blood of Christ, the wine, because it is an enactment of this act of Christ's death where the spear in the side gave him the fifth wound. Yo, stigmata. Look, pay attention to the stigmata. Well, it's telling you to pay attention to the Holy of Holies altar stone. Oh, so... You could not have solved this code when it was first created back in 1601 or two or three or up to 1609 when the science came out. I mean, when they were doing all this, there was no altar stone to be found to even give you the idea that that's what this was talking about, even if you solved it. It was hidden in the catacombs and then ultimately they whoever they were, brought it up and hid it just inches below the ground so that it would be found eventually. They intended it to be found, and obviously, inevitably, it would be found once anybody renovates a church, and it took hundreds of years, and they finally come around to renovate it. Oh, there's the altar. It could only even be solved after 1889. So that's half of it. So there's a living page. Something, page has a double meaning. Uh, a page is he who announces something as well. There's an, a, a preserved document that announces something. Look at the stigmata. Oh, look at the altar. There's the altar where I have hewn. That's a word we don't often use today, but it means cut into stone. Where I have cut into stone, desiderata is Latin for my desires, what I want you to know. There's a document kept alive in the altar. Look, look at the stigmata wounds on the altar where I have cut into stone what I want you to know. It could not be clearer, folks. I mean, it was absolute slam dunk. But of course, my, my dilemma was how am I going to get in there and, and actually <laughs> do that? Should I go to the church and tell them? Uh, it's pretty deep, isn't it? Well, no, probably not. Probably that's not the best idea. Why? Because they might just go there themselves, cut it open, find out what's in there, and if it proves their man, great. If it proves somebody else, not so good for the tourism of Stratford. But it's telling you there's something in the altar. It's called the Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies gets its name from Solomon's temple. Solomon's temple, the third meaning of the TH. TH, 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 remember? Templum Hierosolum, the first temple of Jerusalem, Solomon's temple. The Holy of Holies is literally this part of the entire structure of Solomon's temple, where you enter at the two columns, Boaz and Yakin, and you go through into the Hekel. So these are Yakin. They represent the sun and the moon and many other things. Here it is in parallel 3D fashion. You're into the Hekel, where there are the ten menorah, and then you come into the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant is stored or was stored. 
that Holy of Holies has a Hebrew name. Does anybody know their Hebrew? If you know what that is, send me a comment. It is pronounced Devere. <laughs> I'm not making this up, folks. It comes from the word Devarim, which means word. And that in itself has its ultimate root in the idea of the first word of creation, the vibration, Om. When there is nothing, in the beginning was the word, right? And the word was with God and the word was God. So in the beginning, at the absolute moment, alpha, omega, moment, we're going to have a creation start to vibrate. Unity divides itself into duality, and we now have polarity of male, female, light, dark, positive, negative. It's everywhere in creation, and we can't have a creation without it. That's why the creation is full of conflict. It's just the nature of how it has to be. There's no way you can have the light and the dark, all this polarity, without there being the conflict of working it out. And at some point, some vastly, inconceivably large time <laughs> of uh, eternity, but no, it has, a phys it has an actual physical distance, we are told, in terms of time. Uh, we reach the end of what the Vedas call a, a day of Brahma, one day. And then we have a night of Brahma, where we all just sit and go, wow, that was good. That was wild. And then for some unknown reason, we say, let's do it again. Subject for another, another talk. It's called the Devere. So that is just a mind blower in, its, in itself, isn't it? And so the actual name for the Holy of Holies that, has, that is the center of this encoding is Devere. What do you read? Word. 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 Hmm. Words, 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 Hamlet says. Words. 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 Why is he saying that? What he's actually saying is, when he says words, 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 he's saying devere, devere, devere. The root word. Astonishing, isn't it? Okay. So that is the name of the Holy of Holies. And if then there's something in there, and this was my dilemma and why I had to do this subterfuge, if it's found that what's in there, if we could open it publicly, that was my goal, was to just open it with the world's media there. Full attention, full transparency. And whatever is found is found. Let the dice fall where they may. But if the powers that be that do not want this story to come out I mean, obviously, if I went to the church and said, well, let's just open it, they'd say, well, yeah, well, in fact, they did. I mean, I actually said I offered to pay for the scanning of the altar after I had already scanned it, by the way, as insurance, because I knew that they would likely refuse. And indeed, they did refuse. And then a 
of course, they didn't go any further with it because they just thought I was a nutcase and now I would, I would not take it any further. But I'd already got my insurance back of it. I'd, I'd, I'd already scanned it because I knew I had to have scientific proof, otherwise it might disappear. You know, if what's in there, if, so say there's nothing in there, you know, they, they open it up in public, and there's nothing there. Alan's a complete maniac. You know, he's a nutcase, nothing happened. If what's in there proves their man, oh, well, that would be new front page news the next day. Alan's a hero. Yay! Our guy has been vindicated after all these years. The true Shakespeare is William Shakespeare of Stratford. After all, public holiday, massive celebrations, because this is their, <laughs> this is their, number two tourism attraction after the Tower of London. So that's what would have happened. However, if it showed somebody else, like perhaps De Vere or Bacon or any other candidate, well, you know, my Prius might have developed an electrical problem. I couldn't risk that and I couldn't risk the idea that all this work to find it after all this time, this is the smoking gun. This is the holy of holies. This is the holy grail of literature, really. So um, it forced me into having to, after I'd scanned it, not say a word. And that's why I pulled my book off off the market um, because I didn't know when I wrote the book that I was going to scan it. And then once I scanned it, I realized, oh my goodness, I've actually got physical scientific proof now that it is in the altar. And so I don't want to draw attention to it anymore. And I took it off Amazon and you couldn't buy it anymore. And that's why it's, it's been off the market for so long. I only brought it back on the market um, fairly recently. And so that was the dilemma was, well, my goodness, what's going to happen? I went to Stratford. Beautiful, idyllic Stratford. Saw the church. Walked the grounds where the great bard had travelled himself. Came to the entrance. That's the welcome that you get. Not quite as dramatic as that, I admit, but you know, I've got to make it dramatic for, for, uh, to get the point across. Yes, that sign is there, CCTV cameras in operation. Forensic system in use to protect lead and valuables. Links criminals to the crime scene. 100% conviction rate in court. Police aware, don't risk it. <laughs> in other words, you know as you go in, um, I better not start messing with their altar. Or they, I mean, the whole area is, is, is roped off. The grave, there's a brass rail. You can't get to the grave unless you have special permission to walk inside. Uh, and that's usually granted only to... Um, celebrities or uh, if they're doing a movie or whatever and then the monument itself and certainly not the altar stone back of it that's why I wanted to show you those pictures so you saw the absolute layout of it um, how do you get to the altar if it's going to spray me with a, a a chemical that will stay on my body and my clothes for 12 months so that when they eventually decide they've got you and they nab you, they can actually forensically uh, tie you to the scene of the crime. 100% conviction rate. Not very promising. So obviously I gotta do something about those cameras. I can take care of the spray system by offering to do a concert for them, right? I'm going to do a concert for them in front of the congregation in the church. 
I actually ended up doing two of them, and this is a rather complicated aspect of the story uh, because, I, I mean, I wanted to make it simple when I told it at first. It sounds complicated when you have to start saying, well, I actually did two. I did one in 2011 on November 5th, and I did, an, and that was basically our dress rehearsal in which we wanted to find out could we scan the altar? And that was with a, with a small audience. And we put up this banner. I'll show you the, the, um, the setup. I mean, I had, I had to essentially build something that would stop the audience seeing what was happening behind the banner where the altar is. So, this is us at dress rehearsal. Here's the altar. We're filming, getting the whole thing done. So that's up. Now we, later we do the dress rehearsal and we actually then have an audience. And whilst, whilst the, this audience is there, we, we didn't really know for sure that we'd get anything, but we had to have two shots at it. And so even our cameraman didn't know what we were doing. The main cameraman that you saw there <laughs> pointing his camera towards the altar. Everyone was in the dark about it, except the, those who <laughs> had a need to know. So I had a radar scanner and a person to go back there and film the whole thing in night vision, because the third thing to take care of is the CCTV cameras, which are filming everything constantly. And so therefore, those have got to be blocked off. And so I called for all the lights to be turned off so that those CCTV cameras would not be recording anything. And so, <laughs> and I was, I was playing Sonnet 18 by candlelight facing the monument and it was very, very beautiful and very, very dark. And my scanning technician here <laughs> is rolling out a, a banner uh, along the top of the altar, unseen by everybody, right? Because, of course, he can't be seen at all. Someone's filming it in night vision so that we would have proof that we'd done it. He only had three minutes in which to accomplish this because Sonnet 18, when I had written the music to Sonnet 18, only took three minutes. And so he's frantically scanning behind there to get it done. We get it done. We bring the banner down. Nobody's any the wiser. We go back to our hotel. Here we are in the hotel room looking at the footage of the scanner. We don't know what we're talking about. We don't know what we're looking at. You can't actually see specifically what it represents because it has to be then sent to a lab for analysis but we're, we're pretty confident the radar has stopped reflecting you'll see something that's completely black there's me explaining it totally clueless i'm saying you'll see something that's totally black yes i know what's going on here i i didn't but i knew at least that there was a big black area and that looked pretty promising and so we hit send and within 40 seconds it was on the hard drives of two of the leading radar labs back in the US, mission accomplished. And they both did their, their analysis, unaware of each other. Neither of them knew what it was we were scanning. All I told them was we were scanning a big rock and that we suspected there might be a hole in it that somebody in a family or whatever had put there to maybe hide something. That was our uh, official story because we didn't want them to say, oh, we can't have anything to do with this. We're not going to, I mean, what if, um, what if the Queen's people come knocking? So everyone was sworn to secrecy, NDAs. No one spoke and has not spoken for ooh, nine years now. This guy, well, he wasn't going to say a word anyway. Now, the results are that in every holy of holies altar stone, there has to be what's called a saint's cavity, a small little area where when that 
altar stone is consecrated, it is cut out, they, they cut out stone from the underneath part and they put in what's called a reliquary. It's about the size generally of a small child's shoe box. And that reliquary has to be gold or silver or lead. Very significant, hold that thought. And they put it inside and it has in it what's called relics of a saint, anything that Rome has sent over to say, this is a saint, we deem this person a saint. This is a little sliver of his or her bone. This is a little piece of cloth of something that they wore, maybe a piece of their writings or whatever. And they're put into this little tiny container and they're put in and then the stone is sealed back up underneath, concreted back in, and then they incise on the top the five crosses of the stigmata wounds of Christ. And then it is what is officially called consecrated. And that hole inside it is called a saint's cavity. And the, the people that rented us the radar equipment said that it, the results, you should see an area that is blue, like about that size in the overall gray of the stone that you're scanning. And so that's what we're looking for. Now, our codes indicated that I was hoping it would be at least this big. I had a feeling it would be much bigger, but I couldn't say that's how big it is. 80 inches by eight inches deep by 30 plus inches wide. It's 250 times the size it's supposed to be. And in these scans, these radar scans that give us the final scientific proof that we needed, because without that, we would never convince them to open it. You can see different layers of de different densities within that overall hollow area, which means when they found it in 1889, they didn't open it. They had no idea that there'd be something in there. And so it's still there. So wonderful news. And so the whole push of what I am trying to do with this is to get that altar opened. And the only way that we're going to get it opened is with numbers, sheer virality of numbers. And so we are hoping that all of you will tell your friends about this to say, you know, come on, watch a broadcast catch up on this, find out what this is about. And if you feel so inclined, go to tobeornottobe.org and vote to open the altar. It is not a Prince song. It's not to be or not to be. No, it's the way he wrote it with actual words, to be or not to be.org. Just that. Go to the website and vote, please, because you've got a choice. You can say, yes, I'd like to open it. I want to know what Shakespeare left for posterity. Or, no, I'm not interested. Let's leave it another 400 years. I know that's a little leading. It's a little leading question. I'm thinking most of us won't want to leave it another 400 years. How can you resist? It's like, this is the, this is, this is it, you know? This is the holy grail of literature. Shakespeare, who left nothing. There is no history. There's no paper trail. There's nothing. How can it be that nothing exists? Not a manuscript, not a play, not a poem, not a letter, not a page. Not a line in his own hand, just these six shaky signatures that looks like whoever wrote them had the palsy and couldn't even write, and they're all spelled differently. We have no information on him except documents that refer to him selling real estate, uh, Shakespeare, uh, or suing his neighbors for pennies. Whilst back in London, he's this big star who writes, the quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven. <laughs> but he did. <laughs> back home, no mercy. 
you owe me sixpence. I'm going to take you to court. Um, <laughs> so if you want to know why would there be no history to this? It's, very, it's really, really very clear. If the person that is doing this has an enormous secret to hide and con at the same time convey, then the only way he, she, they, it could, could bring it forward would be through these codes. By encoding it and telling you there's a secret here that I want you to know about, but I can't actually tell you openly, I have to disappear. That's a good place to kind of pause for a moment. Um, it's funny doing it this way. I wish it were live where we were all on a Zoom and you, I could see your faces and you could stick up your hand and say, I have a comment, but the only way is on the comments. So Alejandro. Yeah. Do we have anybody asking a question? Sure, I'll bring you in up shortly. Oh, well, can you give me one, maybe? Yes, sir. Thanks. Which would be? Actually, we do have Sasha Sicarelli. You're on. Sasha, I'm not really sure how to pronounce her name. Send that across to me, would you? The, uh, does she have a question or is she just saying she's there? Uh, yeah. Pass me her name, please. Sasha. Sturrell. Thanks. Um, Sasha, welcome. I, Shasha is with an S-H, uh, S-H. Is associated with Western agent of the Queen? What is she asking? So Shakespeare was an agent of the Queen? Is this what Shasha is asking? Yes. Okay. So the reason I asked for Shasha anyway is that I think yesterday, uh, Shasha, I, I made a comment. I, it's, look, I'm going to be very, very upfront here. <laughs> it's really hard to be, um, as much as you want to be making a communication with everybody, and as much as that's the way you do it, um, in, in terms of social media and expanding one's reach and influence, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you may notice that uh, I'm not really of that generation and I'm not attuned to it. And besides, I've just lived like a monk for the past 16 years doing this. And so I'm, I, I'm clueless. I'm clueless about that side of things. And in an effort to kind of get up to speed on it, Recently, I've been answering everyone's comments, <laughs> which is unsustainable for me. I mean, I wish it weren't, but it's, it is just unsustainable um, because I, I can't. I can't be doing that all the time or I wouldn't have any time to be uh, putting these broadcasts together and getting new discoveries and writing the next book and exploring all the aspects that are associated with this, which I'd like to chat with you about. But anyway, the story behind this, this lady, Shasha, is that I answered, a question, I answered a comment and she wrote back saying, basically, oh, oh my God, is this, is this you, Professor? She said, Professor, I, I thank you for the elevation of my status. I, I, I'm not a professor. Um, I'm just a, I'm just a guy, just a bloke who plays piano. And um, yeah, can you keep those, um, can you keep them steady so I can, thanks. I'll, I'll take care of them one by one. So, so Shasha asked this question, but anyway, what I said to her, she said, oh, it's kind of disbelievingly that she kind of rightly assumed, oh, this guy must be so busy. He's, he, it's not him answering these questions. And I wrote back and said, well, yeah, it is me. Um, but then I can't prove that, right? Because everything's fake news these days. <laughs> so I could be anybody, right? Or I could be somebody in my own. It could be Alejandro answering. It could be someone else. So uh, I wrote back saying, okay, if, you, if I see you on, on the chat tomorrow, I will give you a shout out. So yes, Shasha, that was me. And I'm going to answer your question. 
So Shakespeare was an agent of the Queen. Yeah. Um, of course, this would be secret. <laughs> and so we're not going to necessarily find any absolute conclusive evidence, but there is scattered evidence all over the place that certain people were spies and they had code numbers. And uh, John D's code number, for example, was 007. And I, in my next masterclass, I'm not done with this masterclass yet, but I mean, in, certainly in, if we don't get to it, today where I get into the actual decoding of the the, 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 the nitty-gritty of, of the gravestone and the monument. Uh, you will see that his, his code number is, is fairly well known, was 007. And um, that, of course, was literally used by <laughs> the writer of James Bond to say, oh yeah, I'm going to take that, that's a good, that's a good number. So his, his code number was 007. Uh, Edward de Vere's code number was 40, 40. The King James's code number was 10. So everybody, anyway, had code numbers for when they communicated by code, obviously, because this was secret espionage work. It is known now by piecing all of this together that yes, John D was John D was an agent for the Queen. He's not Shakespeare. He's the person who uh, did an awful lot of, of, of the actual encoding, what I just showed you briefly. Sonnets, gravestone, monument passing into the Enochian tables. He would be the person who had written that. He had to have been because his, 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 his fingerprints are all over it. But again, that's for a deeper dive. You'll see it. But So John Dee is the encryptor as also is Sir Francis Bacon, for sure. Um, now, there is a possibility, it's always been thought to be an en enormous possibility by some, Francis Bacon was William Shakespeare. All of my efforts have been into looking at Edward de Vere, because again, his name is all over it, all over the place. And so um, I only know that I've done most of my research on Edward de Vere and there's just a ton of stuff. But as also, at the same time, I have been finding Bacon codes throughout my research and I've been putting them aside because I didn't know where to fit them into the overall picture. And my very, very dear friend, Peter Dawkins in England is perhaps the leading Bacon expert in, in the world. And he's a tremendous resource and a great help to me to, to help me manage to piece all this together to find out what is, is, is his part in this. Uh, obviously, Peter feels that uh, Bacon is the key, is, is the key writer. Uh, my own opinion is really neutral. I mean, I, I, I feel that Edward de Vere is the main key writer. But on the other hand, um, I cannot ignore the truth of what I've been finding recently, which kind of... Um, shows tremendous connection between the two of them. So isn't that exciting? It's a mystery to be solved. I, 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 I don't, I, I'm not hooked onto one or the other. I won't be bent out of shape if it turns out to be um, whoever it turns out to be, Jake, the plumber. It doesn't matter. All I want is the truth and the truth is being brought to us through these codes. But roundabout way of answering your question, D was certainly an agent of the Queen. Edward de Vere was certainly an agent of the Queen. Francis Walsingham, key uh, uh, cryptographer and spy master. They're all part of the whole thing because uh, cryptography was an essential part of their life. And so, yes, uh, oh, well, of course, Bacon was too. So there's no doubt that whoever was the real Shakespeare was acting as an espionage agent at the same time as getting uh, all these great works written. Oh, and don't forget Marlowe. I'm sorry, I do not mean to cut him out of the picture. So he was certainly an agent and presumably killed, although some people feel he wasn't killed. So thank you, Shasha. That hope that answers your question. We have a question from Grover C. Lowe. 
Shake, oh, it's not really a question, it's a comment. Shake sphere. Well, I presume you're kind of hinting at maybe there's a hidden meaning in his name. I'll put that on hold and I will show you something. Let me make a note to put that up for you. That would be how did Shakespeare actually choose his name? <laughs> I like that, Shakespeare. Rich Jarvis says, T is the horizon. The precious thing is the sun. Okay, T is the horizon. Uh, you might want to write to me about that and go a li little deeper in, in depth into what you mean by that or send a, a more clear question. The precious thing is the sun. Yes, I, I suppose metaphorically you could say that. It, it all gets very deep and I don't pretend to ever, ever say, oh, no, it means this. You know, take my word for it. That would be just foolish. This writer never wrote anything that had only one meaning. That's why we love the writings so much, those who understand the, the writings and do get into it, right? He appeals to everyone. Feminists can claim, oh, he wrote the greatest, strongest roles for women ever. Anti-feminists cite, you know, that what they call that awful play, <laughs> uh, which um, shall be nameless, that indicates that uh, Kate, kiss me Kate, was just a subservient wench to her male macho hubby. It's, you know, uh, it's all commentary, you see. People believe he was anti-Semitic because of certain references in Merchant of Venice, and yet he gives Shylock the best, most heart-achingly beautiful lines that have, show, give you nothing but sympathy for the, the Jewish situation there at the time, and how awful, I mean, I mean it's very clear in Merchant of Venice, the Christians are treating Shylock and all Jews in a terrible way. And so, to, but, and yet there are people that see it and say, oh, no, I just can't say those words. That's anti-Semitic. Not understanding, I, I feel, I believe, that this is, this is social commentary writ large. You, you have to be scathingly honest about how, how people at the time were behaving and feeling and speaking. It doesn't mean you adhere to those feelings. It doesn't mean that Shakespeare believed that. In fact, I see from all the codes, he is the most utterly hum humanitarian, humanist writer that there is. So I don't quite know uh, if Rich wants to add, add more to that question, but please contact me if you do. Uh, Grover adds, that's strange because 153 is a biblical number. Yes, well... Um, you're absolutely right. 153 and 624 equals 777. Hmm. In relation to the sun, it's calendar slide with overlay of calendar dates. Yes, uh, Grover, I'm actually getting to that. I'm going to show you something to do with that. Also from Grover, Archangel Michael, the old serpent bearer, is the constellation of Theucus. Making reference to John D. receiving the angel communications for the Enochian tables. Well, yes, Michael was one of his the four angels. Michael, Uriel, um, were his two key communicators. But the other two archangels, uh, Raphael, was certainly there in the whole thing. Uh, they're part of it. I'm I'm not going to get into that today. Oh, uh, Peggy Ballard Parker. Alan, what about the Northumberland manuscript which reveals Bacon's name along with Shakespeare's? You know, I, I again, I have not concentrated deeply on the Baconian side of things. And so I've, I've seen it in Petter Amundsen's uh, movie and I've read about it, of course. I can't speak intelligently on it and so I won't presume to give an answer, but I would say 
Um, I'll ask Peter Dawkins' opinion on that and, and get to, back to you if you feel you really, if you obviously you want an answer on that. I, my honest answer is I can't, I can't say um, because I haven't investigated it, but I'll check out that, Peggy. Duly noted. Darius Kaufman, aren't you concerned that someone from the church or government in England will see these videos, open up the stone privately and do what they see fit for their own purposes? Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, it came to that point of recognition that, you know, at some point you just have to say what is, is otherwise nothing would get moved, but I, nothing would move. I mean, what I did at the time was not just the scan, but before I got the opportunity or made the opportunity to get the scan, I, I had ingratiated myself into the church's good books by going over there um, six times in the, in the course of about four years, making myself useful to them by helping in certain ways. This was not... Um, disingenuous. I mean, I, I really grew to like all the people there and understand that they themselves are not part of a cover-up. They're just trying to run a church. They, it's not as though they think they know that, oh, there's a cover-up here and let's keep everybody out. And that's not, going, that's not what's going on. The people who, with the vested interest, are far bigger players in this overall scene and i don't know who they are you know honestly whether they are behind uh, the monarchy or they are lurking in the shadows of shadow government i i mean i don't know but we do know that <laughs> the such characters certainly exist and we do know that the pressure that is brought to bear on anyone who brings forth an alternate viewpoint, shall we say, uh, gets to know very, very quickly that they are going to be attacked fairly mercilessly. And that's, that's the sad part of it. But it's not the church that's doing that. It's the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust and those who are in power behind it who think, well, you know, there's this multi-billion dollar industry called Shakespeare products uh, worldwide. There's also the industry of the um, oh, selling college courses, university courses in literature, right? Telling a certain story. Don't rock the boat. It's, it's hard to pin down where the, the, the problem is, but to answer your question simply, you know, were you not concerned that they would just open it up? I, 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 I created a calendar for them at one time that they could sell in their gift shop to raise money for the church. I uh, was in negotiations with them to have Davy Jones of the Monkees do a special concert, a benefit concert for them. That didn't happen because he passed away before that could happen. But they got to know me very well because I was there a lot. And so they gave me um, uh, far more penetrating permission than most people get. Consequently, I was there on three separate filming uh, episodes where I filmed every square inch of that altar. I knew exactly every crack in the mortar. It's actually concreted into the back wall and so it's not a simple matter of just them going in and doing you know say taking it out it would be a massive operation what they would have to do is first they might scan it themselves and that would be easy enough to do after hours sometime and even if they did that they would find the same results that i found and then they say oh my god alan's right there is something here but so long as it goes nowhere, so long as no one makes a big deal out of it, so long as Alan gets no uh, traction on this story, uh, we don't have to worry. We're never going to have to open it. There's never going to be any pressure, right? 
So they wouldn't need to go to that extreme effort uh, because it would be a lot of effort. And so knowing that I've, I've literally, I have got it all documented. So if something ever were to happen, I could show my pictures compared to how it looks now after they supposedly did something. And I could prove that someone had gone in and, and taken something. Now, that doesn't mean that we even get it necessarily. And it doesn't mean that my Prius still would not blow up. But it does, <laughs> it does mean that the story would be very bad for the church. You know, so they're not going to risk that, I don't believe. Secondarily, if it became a, a story big enough that we could actually bring some power to bear into the situation, uh, however they opened it up would be with modern tools. Again, we could prove forensically that it had been opened up recently and that it, whatever was there was gone. What a scandalous situation that would be for the church and for the orthodoxy. They, they don't want that. They don't want to be thought of by the entire world as having taken this, this gift that the real Shakespeare, whoever he was, gave to us and then, and then made it disappear. So, no, I, I didn't ever think it was a real danger, except from the per point of view of that in order to pull it off, they'd have to feel that I was getting very near to getting enough attention publicly. Uh, in other words, a million votes, say, two million votes, uh, getting there with Oprah, with her microphone in their face saying, are you going to open the altar? By that time, you know, if it got that big, they wouldn't be able to do anything. So they'd have had to have done it before. Um, so my hope was always that we would, we would make rapid progress suddenly, which is what happens with social media. Right now, if they wanted to do something, they'd have to close down the church. They'd have to invent some false flag operation, say, oh, there's a gas leak. And uh, it, it would be a massive, inconceivably massive operation because I know the structure and how it is literally concreted into the whole wall. There's no way that they could get into it in any way, shape or form without doing massive damage to the whole structure. Therefore, they'd have to invent something. Therefore, they'd have to do it under the guise of, and you know, the church is still open. You know, people can go in. It's not as though it's closed due to COVID. People go in with masks. And so it, I don't, I understand your concern. Believe me, it was my main concern. It's why I kept quiet for six years, trying to get all these ducks in a row to make sure that we were absolutely in a, in a, when I say powerful position, I don't mean it in a, in, a, in a way to mean, oh, we've got to have the power, meaning that we would have some kind of negotiation stance against the church. And the way that I thought was best to do that was to actually offer it to them as, as something that is very good for them, because honestly, truly it is. So they could offer, imagine the ability, if, if <laughs> it's not a Catholic church, it's Catholic light. Yes, granted, now it's a Protestant church of England. But nevertheless, they still have mass there at that altar. And so uh, the vicar, uh, Reverend Gorick, said to me, we consider it. Uh, Catholic light. We still honor those rituals. We still have mass. Um, and so from a Catholic church's point of view, what a wonderful thing to be able to do. You know, they need some good publicity, <laughs> right? After all the scandals, they need a good story. There couldn't be a better story than let's bring the truth of Shakespeare to the world. Let's not act politically. Let's not try to save our butts. Just do what's right open the altar. And so it is my hope that that, is, that will prevail. There was no way that I could continue the subterfuge for much longer uh, without word getting out that I had done it. And so I just bit the bullet and, and said I'd done it. But anyway, long-winded answer, but I hope it's an important uh, subject to cover deeply. And so honestly, I feel that that's not possible for them 
Uh, and if we actually get social media moving very, very quickly, we could be there with um, a very, very, actually a very wonderful um, opportunity for them to do the right thing. I'm, maybe I'm being more hopeful than I should be. Many of my friends have said so in that regard. Oh, well, you know, they're never going to open it. But actually, I have news coming on down the pike. Uh, shortly that I can't really talk about e yet until uh, more uh, pieces of the puzzle have been put into place. But no, I think we're going to get cooperation and I think we're going to get it opened. It's as simple as that. So uh, let's hold on these other, we've got a couple of other questions. Let me, well, let me see what they are, see if I can answer them without going to uh, other things. Grant Devitt says, is that image representing De Vere painted portrait with mask fully verified to be of him. Uh, well, it's known as the Ashbourne portrait. Um, and that's a deep subject in itself. And so, <laughs> good questions. Everyone is so into this. I really appreciate it. I would have to give a masterclass on that alone. If you know anything about it, and it sounds as though you maybe do, you know that Charles Wisner Barrell uh, had that painting x-rayed uh, and established that it is a portrait, is a portrait of Edward de Vere. No sooner did he do that than the orthodox uh, moved in and the x-rays disappeared. Oh, how surprising. And then a consistent, a consistent effort to uh, bring disrepute to his work was underfoot. And not only that, the, the Folger Shakespeare Library in the United States started to say, no, 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 that's a portrait of Hammersley, the Lord Mayor of England. And if you compare it to other portraits of Hammersley, that's just a complete joke. <laughs> it's just not even close. So no, I think there's sufficient evidence from Charles Wisner Barrel to show that yes, indeed. I mean, but the, the horror of it is that if that is an existing portrait of the real Shakespeare, which when it was found in the Ashburn, Ashburn um, gallery, it was labeled portrait of Shakespeare. <laughs> Simple as that. And then it, it, it changed hands and it ended up being, you know, being changed over the years. And they pulled back the hairline to make it look more like the official portrait of Shakespeare. But then they erased the ring, the boar ring that is the ring of the Oxford uh, family crest. And by judicious uh, um, research work for, of, of Wisner Barrel and others, they found that, no, 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 there's a ring under there, but it's been painted over. So somebody actually painted over an original portrait that was probably of Shakespeare, well, certainly of De Vere, and if De Vere is Shakespeare, a portrait of Shakespeare, and just vandalized it in order to suit their, their ends. So yeah, it, it, it's, it's a very sad state of affairs when those who claim to say we only want, you know, we're bringing Shakespeare to the world, but they're making a, a, an immense effort to, to cover up any, any evidence that contradicts the orthodox story. Alan Armstrong says, possibly both De Vere and Bacon played parts in the Shakespeare project, perhaps De Vere as the most important author, and Francis Bacon after De Vere's death as the organizer and lead producer of the official publications, two poems, sonnets, plays in FF, in first folio, as well as the Stratford hoax. Um, yeah, I would say that that's what I had felt until recently. 
And I, I don't mean to be coy. I mean, I was, you know that Alejandro here and my other partners in this, Filiberto and Ryan and Melanie, who are on the team of Bard Code and Bardcast and without whom I could not do this. Um, they totally rebuilt the website from uh, the state that it was in for years and years and years where I could do nothing about it. And finally, we've got a really, really beautiful functioning website, uh, which I'm sure you've all seen. Um, I was all set to, re to launch that website on what date? June 24th, was it, Alejandro? Is there any significance to that? Six, June 24th. June 24th. I think that's... Rings the bell, 624. 624, yeah. We, we, we were going to launch it on 624. And um, we were <laughs> under tremendous pressure to get it all done. Oh, make sure you get it out. And two weeks before we were about to launch, and of course, it was going to be essentially solidly nothing but Oxfordian information. And I'm sure my Oxfordian friends, well, I don't have many Oxfordian friends, to be honest, mm -hmm. Because they do. <laughs> That's another story entirely. <laughs> I have one or two. Michael Delahoyd, who was on the very, very first podcast, is my dear, dear, dear Oxfordian he's, friend. He's what? Delahoyd. He's listening. Oh, great. Hello. <laughs> Hello, Michael. So, um, you know, uh, so there's a few, but honestly, the rest of them. They're, I, I, it's sad to say, but they're all on their own. I mean, I, I'm not going to knock anybody. It's okay. It's all right. But they don't want me in their club because I'm talking about codes and they just think they've got enough on their plate without talking about codes. So fair enough. Um, but <laughs> I was all set to launch. Um, and essentially, you know, I would, I would have brought forward that, that point that you just made. It's off my screen right now, so I don't know what his name. I think his name was Alan, somebody. But the point was, um, that's what I thought. I thought, yeah, uh, obviously John D was the l leader of the Rosicrucian movement, the secret Rosicrucian movement, and he passed the mantle to Francis Bacon, who became the leader of the Rosicrucian movement. And so certainly after 1609, once John D had passed, it was Francis Bacon's uh, job to make sure that all this came to fruition with the first folio and there's such I mean it's, it's so deep it just goes so deep into the folio as to wh how, how that is encoded and I'll, I, I'll we'll have some time to get into that I think I'm sure if people are still on are you still there <laughs> how many people have we got um, okay it's about three o'clock we're going on two hours we can keep going um, that's what I would have thought, Alan. And then something that I will, I promise I will be revealing, I can't say very soon, fairly soon. And by fairly soon, my anticipation of it is, is by the end of the year. Uh, and the preamble to that is the Fisher Kings series that is now on the website. And if you watch Act one and act two, which are the, the, the shorter versions. There's parts one through six and seven and eight are coming up, but they, are, they go much more thoroughly. But for the simple shortest version possible, you've got act one and act two. Act three is coming, but it inevitably leads to what I'm going to tell you about without telling you the depth of it. And that is that just two or three weeks before I was about to launch the website, uh, I made a discovery which shook me to my core, and I thought it was going to be just another Edward de Vere, John D. Um, creation. And it sure was that. It was very deep. It was a gridded code, and you haven't seen a lot, any really in-depth coded grids yet because I wanted to smoothly cover as much ground as I could, and I realize as I'm getting into it that... I talk a lot, and so it's going to be slower than we thought, but that's all right. We've got nothing but time on our hands due to COVID, unfortunately. Um, and plus, it's, it's, it's a fun way to do it. You will enjoy it piece by piece. But anyway, to cut a much, much longer story, much, much shorter, 
something came through that was very, very clearly, oh yeah, it's talking about De Vere. Oh yes, there's John Dee's name, here's Edward De Vere's name, here's, his, here's the Henry Rosely connection. And then all of a sudden it led very, very strongly to the name Francis Bacon. And I would just say this, not in just a way that suggested what I had previously thought, that he was the uh, follow-up encryptor, but highly suggestive that he is one of the writers. And so I had to, I, I, I mean, all I want is truth. I couldn't just hide my head and say, no, 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 I've worked on De Vere for 16 years, going on 17 years. I'm only going to present the Oxfordian point of view. That's not me. It's not what this is about. We want the truth. Truth will out. It must come out. I do not care who it is. I honestly don't. It does not sway me from, from my utter conviction that De Vere is, is uh, I can't is say, say the central writer anymore. He is a, certainly, I would not be surprised if he was the totally central writer and that Francis Bacon wrote some of the works, but it may turn out that Francis Bacon and he wrote them 50-50 between them, or somehow they were, I, I don't know. I will just freely admit, I don't know. I can only tell you what the codes say, and when the codes are as explicit as they are, and believe me, um, as you will see as this whole masterclass progresses, that it is endlessly informative that if you saw something saying Edward de Vere, John D, 007, uh, hints that blah, 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 blah. You'd say, okay, well, that's interesting. If you saw it three times, you'd begin to think, oh, hmm, there's something to this. If you saw it seven, eight, nine, ten times, you'd be beginning to say, all right, I think I can hang my hat on this. If you've seen it 50 times, um, well, there's just no doubt, okay? It's just, <laughs> that's clear. It's the truth because they're writing these codes to be redundant for a specific purpose that wherever anybody found them, if you came in from this direction or you came in from that direction or from here or from here or from here, you would all eventually find your way to this massive, wonderful hope diamond of a cathedral-like structure in the middle that says the whole thing. Oh, my goodness. What a piece of work is man. <laughs> and is whoever did this. It's, it's, it's stunning. And so, no, I, it has not swayed me at all. It's just opened my mind further to the idea that I think Bacon is, is more of a piece of this than I, than I ever thought he was before. But I was always open to it. I kept seeing codes and, see, and setting them aside. So what I, am, what I can say is that Fisher Kings is leading to this denouement that I can confidently say is as important as the altar, but not the altar. It's something else. And that's all I can say at this moment. And I really, really, and the only reason for that coyness is we're trying to get certain people on board who have, uh, will have some clout so that we can go to the church and, 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 and just plead with them from, from the heart to say, you know, this is too big. You've got, you've got to let the public know this. You can't just keep on hiding. It's actually very good for you. If it ends up that your man is not the key writer, okay, you know, I, what, what if he's a key, utter key player in this that you had not even suspected? Because that's, that's the truth. That, that is the truth. So let me go back to Oh, I'm new to the, look at that. I really, I've been sharing my screen all this time. So I'm so new to this that I didn't know to switch back to um, the mode where you could see my uh, screen large. So try and remember to cue me on that. Uh, I'll share mine. Well, I've been talking for an hour and uh, it, I, that's, a, that's a shame. I'm sorry. So you've only seen me in this top. Uh, right hand corner here. Uh, I forgot to stop share screen. So now I'm sharing screen again. Shakespeare anagram. Okay. I forget who asked the question, but the question was Shakespeare. 
let's go to Ehye Ashe Ehye. If this guy likes anagrams so much, which he very, very clearly does, which I haven't shown you, even begun to show you the depth of how, how deep that goes. I showed you that I am that I am is the translation of Ehye Ashe Ehye, or sometimes just I am that. And so that could be said to be I am Asher. And William Shakespeare contains that phrase, I am Asher, with what's left over is will speak. And that's how they spelled speak in those days. I am Asher. I am that I am. The divine will speak. That's interesting, I think. If you set aside just the I am will, which he says so often, and you look at what is in the word Shakespeare, is it Shakespeare? No, uh, but it is seek a sephar. What is a sephar? A sephar is a numbering system or a book. It comes from the root word sephir, which gives us sephirot, the secret code of the Kabbalah and tree of life and everything that we all know about that, that, that symbol, the sephirot. And of course, it's also the root word of cipher. So seek a sephar literally means look for a secret numbering system in a cipher code book. That's what he's... <laughs> His name means, I mean, if, he, if this is a made up name, which we know it is, right? It's a pen name. It was written with a, a hyphen as often as it was written without. Look for a secret numbering system in a cipher code book where I am a share, I am that I am, will speak, where the divine will speak through me. I mean, that's literally about as accurate a record of what is really going on as you could wish for, isn't it? That is literally, he's been compared to a God-like being. And the more we go into the deeper, the, uh, the depth of these codes where he is riffing on I am that I am, where he's saying outright, I am that I am. So what is that numbering system? What is that cipher code book? <laughs> I would put to you that it's this because in this book he says no i am that i am sonnet 121 and they that level at my abuses right i am that i am so thanks for that nudge towards that about shakespeare we're relatively certain oh, okay i'm going to stop this for you we're relatively certain. I want to just, yeah, definitely want to play this for you. This guy, uh, he's, uh, you know, he's the academic side of things. And it's just wonderful. And I thought it would be fun to show you today so, something very, very, this was from my very early work before I was showing anything to anybody. Um, and I had sort of put it all into a a thing about Star Trek. And then I saw this thing from this guy, this, in, this academician who says, I'm still uncertain about the, the, the volume level here, uh, Alejandro. I have to ask because yeah, it, it seems... We hear it all right. Yes, okay. Yes, we are kind of here. All right, sorry. No, okay. okay. This guy says... We're relatively certain of the accuracy of our reconstruction of Egyptian civilization. Because if we were to take the alternative view, think of what we're stuck with. We have a antediluvian civilization, and then you have nothing. And then it starts up again. Three, four, five thousand years apart, it sounds like a Star Trek episode. <laughs> it sounds like a Star Trek episode, yes. Well, he's not so far off, you know. Um, this was written by John Milton. What need my Shakespeare for his honored bones, the labor of an age in piled stones, or that his hallowed relics should be hid under a starry 
pointing pyramid. This is in the second folio, printed in 1632. So why does he say starry pointing pyramid? All the pyramids are pointed. A pointed pyramid would make sense, but he says starry pointing, pointing to the stars and pointing is a, just a very peculiar way of, of indicating it until you realize, oh, that's a, the Y, star E is a, a Y and the A star part is, is, is Latin for star anyway, a star. So you end up with, he's, he's giving it as a hint there about pyramid for whatever reason. And when you begin looking at the Great Pyramid, there are all these thoughts that have gone into, uh, oh my goodness, so many theories, right? This is, this is the way it was built. Uh, I think it helps honestly to see this, even though we're jumping straight to the pyramid here, uh, without doing the other codes that lead up to it. I'm assuming everyone has seen uh, the sonnets. To get a sense of the mag, I mean, this is the official story, right? 100,000 slaves pulling these massive stones, each of which weighs at least a Cadillac, two and a half to three tons, but some of them are as much as 80 tons of marble in the, in the king's chamber. But that's how it was built. Um, and that ultimately, it's not just a pile of stones. It's got all this inside it. You know, this massively, beautifully engineered hint of, of geometry pointing to the stars. Huh? Starry pointing pyramid. This is Orion, of course. So this is from a Star Trek episode. I mean, this is... <laughs> I love this. This is a Star Trek episode where they see a gateway that is sort of a portal and they see this image of the Great Pyramid through it. Overlaid onto that, I've put this idea that Robert Boval brought forward that became known as the Orion Hypothesis, that the pyramids are laid out in the exact uh, uh, same uh, shape and angles and ratio as the pyramids at Giza. Um, and there's no doubt that that was a marvelous insight. I, I, I don't, I think it's been debunked, not fully debunked, but what I mean by that is that it's not utterly, absolutely perfectly accurate, but I haven't kept up with that. So maybe it was perfectly accurate at some distant time, and that would be a clue to knowing exactly when it was built. But Setting that aside, it, it's certainly very, very, very close right now. So that's there. And that far left star in Orion's belt. <laughs> so he's actually sort of, he's drawing his attention to it there, uh, giving us a little hint about how that might have uh, been in the popular zeitgeist at the time. Here's a cross-section idea, 3D cross-section of the Great Pyramid. Um, where I want to show you that it is echoed in this idea of, in Shakespeare's time, he would have said 5150. And so that angle of 5150, you, we know there's 440 cubit side. That means that the half base in the middle of this triangle that we're representing here is 220. That by Pythagorean theory, we can calculate the, the apothem side at 356 cubits. The height is 280 cubits. And so it's very interesting that that 5150 angle, or even the 51.843, which is minutely, minutely above it, 5150 is actually 51.8333333, is 186,600 arc seconds, <laughs> which is practically another way of representing the speed of light in miles per second. Um, then 
someone, I don't remember who, it's all over the internet, had postulated that the inscribed circle in, in the square of the pyramid and the exoscribed circle around the square of the pyramid uh, is almost giving you the speed of light when you subtract one uh, circumference from the other. In cubits, there's that value. You must multiply by pi over six to get it in meters, and it's 299.790460. You know, the actual speed of light is 299.792. So amazingly close, right? It, it, it's literally that close, 99.9994% accurate. The 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 two circles that are associated with the square base that on top of the idea that it's all been placed at a latitude that gives us the precise value i mean it's just really crazy beyond belief that okay if they're hinting at the speed of light in three different ways who are we to say, oh, no, 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 that's a coincidence, a coincidence, and another coincidence. It's just nuts, yeah? Explain. I can. For this to do what it does is impossible by any science I understand. So I had just put that together as a, as a funny sort of thing to just amuse myself. Three, four, five thousand years apart, it sounds like a Star Trek episode. God, God said, let there be light, and there was light. So we're looking, looking at the angle of this side face here, the 5150. How does Shakespeare let us know he knows this? Underneath here is, I've told you about the first folio, and the, it's got a ton of wrong page numbers in it. It's known as the most valuable printed textbook First folio last went on auction in 2006, fetched six and a half million dollars for one book. It's full of wrong page numbers. People say, actually, it would be worth far much more if it wasn't such a botched print job. People just don't look further into this because you know, we have studied this book over and over and over and over, and we know almost which people uh, actually printed which pages because they each have a sort of a style and a, and a hand uh, that they call it uh, connected with it. Oh, I can recognize here, this is Fred's work. All the page numbers stay wrong through all the publications. They change a comma here, they change the spelling of this word here, they change a the paragraph here, they change all kinds of things. They never change the wrong page numbers. They get printed and printed and printed and printed. They're always wrong. It's the funniest thing. I think the printers must have been standing around looking at Ben Johnson or Bacon or whoever was there overseeing it. And they were going, uh, what about the wrong page numbers? Oh, don't bother about the wrong page numbers. That, that, that just doesn't matter. And they must have said between themselves, bloody aristocrats have got more money than sense, you know, because this is the biggest thing on the page, this is the numbers. And they're, they're going, no, change this comma spell this word differently, <laughs> but they never change the wrong page numbers. Therefore, they are intentional. Therefore, they are fixed. They have a purpose. So the very first wrong page number is here. Go from 48 to 49 to 58. All right, see that again? It goes from 48 to 49 to 58. Should be 50, right? Down at the bottom of that page, he says, Here, here, here be my keys. Ascend my chambers. Search, seek, find out. There's an ascending passage and a descending passage. There are three chambers. Here, here, here. Search, seek, find out. Ascend my chambers. Between a wrong page number 50 and the right page number 51. That's the very first wrong page number. And you think, well, wow, that's very strange. Wow, okay. Ascending passageways, chambers, 5150. Does he know this? How does he know this? All right. So I had the notion that, well, look for, is he telling us he knows, he knows the speed of light? Just like the builders of the pyramid knew the speed of light? Is that even possible? So 
the only way that he could use the sonnets as a coding device would be to in the sonnet numbers they all have numbers except number one which has no number interestingly so i did a search for speed in the sonnets and you find it occurs just three times in 50 and 51 also the line thus far the miles are measured <laughs> okay speed 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 Though mounted on the wind in winged speed, no motion shall I know. That is actually a plank from uh, essentially Einstein's theory of relativity. You don't feel movement at all, no matter how fast you're moving. It cannot be found. No motion shall I know. In winged speed, though mounted on the wind. Uh, oh, is he saying that? Wow. I don't know. Is he an, an, <laughs> is he an Einstein? So, let's take it further. Speed, speed, speed. Put those aside, those sonnet numbers. 50, 51, and 51. Are you blinded yet? I decided to look for the light sonnets. These are the sonnets that have the word light in them. You put those together. So we've got speed and light. Speed of light is like an equation, isn't it? The speed of light, if you say a quarter of something, the four is on the bottom, the one is on the top. So speed of light. Speed sonnets of the light sonnets. And you just multiply them together and it gives you this and that gives you this number, which means nothing. And you think, oh, well, that, that didn't make any sense. But then I realized, well, does he use the word pyramids anywhere in the sonnet? Yes, only in one sonnet, sonnet one, two, three. That's rather perfect, isn't it? It's a triangular number on a base two, one, two, three. What, what, what represents a triangle better than one, two, three, or a pyramid structure? One, two, three, pyramids. Okay, so let's multiply by one, two, three. That gives you that number. That doesn't ring a bell. I must be wrong. Wait a minute, maybe he's actually cleverer than we think. Maybe he's working in biblical cubits. To change biblical cubits into meters, you must multiply by pi over six. And that gives you, and I've called it metra, just to give it a name, metra. It gives you this number. Ah. Huh. That's pretty darn close. It's 99.84% accurate. Now, to put it into perspective, we didn't know the speed of light then. The Greeks thought it was infinite before 1600. Speed, uh, light just in, infinite, just gets to you from wherever. It's instant. Um, and then Roma gets the, gets the accolades for discovering the speed of light. Yay! Yay! He's 26.5% uh, out, but nevertheless, he's gone down in history as the person that first discovered the speed of light. And then through the years, we get these Bradley, Foucault, Einstein. Einstein was using the number uh, of Foucault until Rosa and Dorsey came along in 1907, just in time for uh, the theory of uh, special relativity to come out. And that number they got is the first number that beats Shakespeare's accuracy. In 1907, 99.98% accurate from what we now know it to be. And in 1975, we finally knew it to be 299792458. <laughs> well, I, no, I never doubted. I didn't think, well, that's just a fluke. But I thought he's, there must be a system that he's using here. And so the system can be distilled and brought down to whatever you're looking for. Let's say you want to find uh, distance Earth to Sun. 
we're going to look for the sonnets that contain the word earth, the sonnets that contain the word sun, the sonnets that contain the word distance. And we're going to multiply by the Shakespeare equation, which is always going to be the same. That's going to be the pyramid multiplied by pi over six, what I've called metric, right? Because that's how I found that you could convert the prior one into this mystically magical, how does he get it? Speed of light. How do you do that? So if you literally do that, it comes to one four seven zero oh, eight nine, and that is in kilometers. Ninety nine point nine nine four percent accurate of the average distance Earth to Sun, because there are do, there are different distances, of course, as perihelion and aphelion, but it's the average. I mean, this is mind boggling. Also, the fact that it's in kilometers. He gives one in cubits. He gives one in kilometers. What about Earth to Moon? Moon sonnets, Earth sonnets, distance sonnet, pyramid, metra, add it all up, boom. 99.9% .9 accurate in miles. He's telling us he knows <laughs> the, cu the, the biblical cubit references, the imperial references, miles, and the metric references kilometers. Now, those of you who have f followed my work on this know that that is utterly integral to what I launched in 2016 at CPAC, which was the universal constant of measure that shows that the foot cubic meter is embedded in the Great Pyramid. Now, I, I, I can't explain how I, I knew to go looking for this. It, I had done six years of, of poetic codes only. And suddenly, around about December 20th, 2012, I got the, uh, the inspiration that I knew he had embedded the speed of light. <laughs> I didn't tell anybody because I thought, oh, it's just crazy. I've got to find it first. And, but I, I knew it was there. And then when I found it, I realized, oh, my God, I just, that happened around about just at the exact point when the Mayan calendar ended. I wasn't even thinking of that, and I wasn't particularly attuned to it, but that's when it happened. And from then on, I, I was off on another tangent of six years of math constants, because it all became math constants. After then, I found the, 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 the pyramid in the sonnets, so title page, etc., etc. So he knows the speed of light, and he's not afraid to use it. He, I mean, who is this? You, I mean, you, you really, really are faced with a conundrum here about what is going on here. The actual size of the sun is this, 4,379 times 10 to the 6. Circumference, 4,379. Earth, 40. Moon, 10,916. It doesn't matter whether you're dealing with the diameter or the circumference, and that we will bring into the, the ratio the whole idea of its distance. The point is, it's at the perfect distance so that the moon looks the same size as the sun, so that you can have a total eclipse. I mean, that in itself is one of the most extraordinary phenomena there is, that it's just exactly right, that Goldilocks moment of stunning, isn't it? How, how do they do that? Now, if you want to get this ratio, you divide sun circumference by the earth circumference, you get the moon circumference. Wow. Okay. Sonnet numbers. Here comes the sun. There's the sun sonnet. Earth sonnets. All right. Ratio. This is astounding. He's, he's, he's given us the moon in, in, in its relationship to the sun and the earth sonnets. 
And then if you want to do then using distance, there's only one sonnet that has the word distance in it, sonnet 44. You do sun, and its circumference is 2 pi r. Circumference, you, you could say these are the words for it, circumference, circle, round, around. He uses the word rondeur. But ultimately, when he's using distance in the formula, he ends up telling us the distance. We don't include the distance part, he's telling us it in terms of the circumferences of these planetary bodies that are in correct ratio to the sonnet numbers. It, it's just mind-bogglingly ludicrous. And so this Shakespeare equation part between the two vertical lines, that's always steady. That's the thing that you multiply. That's, the, that's the, the Rosetta Stone, as it were. All he has to do is get the right numbers for these things that he wants to convey. And it's, it's, it's really limited to that. Speed of light, sun, moon, and earth. That's what he's concerned with. But he knows a lot about them. And then you end up with this specific thing, this thing that I have called the Shakespeare equation, which is essentially pyramid, one, two, three, times pi over six. And when you multiply by that, he, imagine he had to work it out in his head that whatever I'm, I'm getting this to work out to, I've got to consider that it has to have a common denominator so that no one will just think, oh, I'm, this is just made up. You're just, you know, just cherry picking the numbers. No, they're all multiplied by the same unit factor called the Shakespeare equation, 123 times metra pi over six. So if you look at it, uh, let's just examine only that. It's pi over six. You, another way of writing it is 123 over six times pi. Everybody understand that? 123 times pi over six is the same as 123 over six times pi. And 123 over six is 20.5. So the Shakespeare equation just boils down to 20.5 times pi. Well, 20.5, there is no sonnet 20.5. There's only a cusp between sonnet 20 and sonnet 21, and that is a fixed sonnet, fixed in heaven's air, he says, right? And that's Sonic 21 and 20, which is June 24th and 23rd, the cusp. What is that? It's Midsummer's Eve and then Midsummer's Day and Midsummer's Night. The night, the midnight cusp at which Edward de Vere just disappeared off the face of the earth. Twenty point five. I, I envision how he did it was he must have put on a production of Midsummer Night's Dream for all his friends. I, I can't see it any other way. Can you imagine? He must have. <laughs> I mean, this is going into pure speculation. Don't quote me on this because I don't want people online saying, you know, Alan Green said something you can't prove. Therefore, all the work stinks. No, no, it's not that. I'm just, I'm just having fun. I'm just saying I can't imagine doing it any other way because Midsummer Night's Dream is all about this. This is what he's telling us. And he actually made the mathematical solution, this, 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 this pyramid sonnet, one, two, three, multiplied by the very thing that you convert cubits and meters through, pi over six, make that be a number pi 20.5 halfway between 20 and 21 june 23rd to june 24th the cusp of for them then the solstice so obviously midsummer night's dream is going to be all about telling us this isn't it it cannot be any other way 20.5 is his way of saying summer solstice celebration, midsummer night's dream, six, two, four. And that as an equation references what is on the cover of the sonnets, the three, four, five triangle is all to do with 
there you've got that that ends up being if you divide the entire circumference of a circle like that, you get pi 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 when you're dealing with putting a precise pentagon in in the center of it i've made the, the values work out so that it is that just to show you this if he's talking about this five-pointed star which is his emblem on the de Vere family's heraldic crest it's all about the golden ratio because there's the golden ratio is utterly embedded in the pentagon and the pentagram And that's what made me know once I got up close to the altar that, yeah, there you go. There's a five-pointed star in, the, in that there. And there's me when I still had a life and hair with color in it. Don't follow my example, boys and girls. Don't get an obsession about um, solving codes. It will turn your hair white and you'll age very, very quickly. There it is, the five-pointed star emblem. Now, of course, subsequently, I have to say, to be fair, Francis Bacon's emblem has two five-pointed stars in it. So what are you going to do? <laughs> this cross-section here that, that just multiplies itself here looks awfully like, awfully close to a three, four, five triangle. It's not. It cannot be, technically. It can be only... It, it is the minutest, tiniest little bit out. And in fact, he proves that in, in the sonnet. So the, we're going to give away this to whoever can answer a question. And it's the first person to send the comment in. So get your, uh, get your fingers ready. Early on, I showed you that the key ligature that gives this game away is a T and an H. T and an H ligature together as a digraph. So, and it resembles the TH symbol for the triple tau, the name of God, the I am that I am. And I showed you that they are present on the gravestone. And I showed you they're present on the monument in Stratford. Okay, so you ready? Here's the question. How many THs are there on the monument in Stratford? First person to answer it correctly wins a copy of the book. So now I'll go over to these questions. Kenneth Dakin says, Alan, yes, it doesn't really matter who the collaborators were, but I do know who WS really was. He was not from Stratford. His father was not John Shakespeare. His grandfather was not Richard Shakespeare. Okay, so is this a question? He says, then I'm perplexed that you have not addressed my comments. Oh, well, okay, so yeah, well, um, don't, don't be upset. I'm, I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm not seeing them. I'm giving a presentation and then at a suitable moment, they're being passed along to me. So uh, no need to be perplexed that I haven't answered your comment. Um, anyway, however, it's not a question, it's a comment. So I don't really know how to address it, except you were saying in caps, you are saying, I do know, I know who WS was. I really do, four exclamation marks. So, um, okay. Tell us. I don't know how else to um, answer that. So, Kenneth, if you want to tell us who it is, please tell us. I'm sure everybody will be enlightened and, and happy to hear. I do, I'm not being sarcastic. I just don't, I don't know what you mean by W.S. could mean W. William Shakespeare, or it uh, could mean Shakespeare or whatever. So it's a bit, a bit of confusion there because you're saying he was not from Stratford. Well, maybe are you saying Shakespeare was not from Stratford and his father was not John Shakespeare? Or are you saying the real William Shakespeare was not from Stratford? Because I think that's what this whole thing 
is about. So anyway, let's keep it polite and just uh, give us your answers. What does this mean? Geez, sorry. Oh, I see. I'm sorry. <laughs> Alejandro, you have to pay attention. That was that. All right. So behind the scenes is how it goes, folks. I ask a question and I don't even tell Alejandro what the question is going to be. And then I don't tell him what the answer is. And he's supposed to know when somebody makes comments. <laughs> <laughs> While doing the broadcast. <laughs> <laughs> Whilst doing the broadcast of the whole thing. And he doesn't want to uh, uh, cut anybody off and, and, and say, oh, no, no, you're not. Because he doesn't know, right? So, but it does kind of make you wonder, doesn't it? I mean, how is he spending his time, really? I mean, there's all these books behind me here. He, he could have looked it up. You know, he's got nothing but free time on his hands. I know. I happen to know. <laughs> <laughs> we still haven't gotten one person with the right uh, answer, though. We still don't have one person with the right answer. My goodness. Oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. Students, if Michael Delahoy is still on, I want Michael to answer me, not the answer to the question, but how would you deal with students who are not paying attention? <laughs> Should I, should I wait another two minutes and then ask a different question? A slightly easier question, maybe? That's all right, we're all learning. I'm not, I'm just having fun. Maybe you wanna ask it again? I will ask it again. On the monument, I might even flash up a picture of it very quickly and not show, and <laughs> give you a chance to ask them. Think of it, come on now, think it through. Remember the monument? Monument, right? I had, Bill and Ted come on and go, no way, right? Are there any THs on the monument? And the THs flash up to tell you, ah, and that tells you there's a certain shape, right? To the, what numbers have we been talking about? 426 and 624. There you go, I gave it away. Somebody's got to get it, get it quick. Come on, I want to give a book away here. So, I'm going to share my screen again and go back and show you one other beautiful thing that takes us deeply into that whole idea that I just told you about why the pentagon and the pentagram is, is significant, okay? Oh, it's hot in here. So, so this will will be close. We'll be closing it out with this because we're at three fifty-five. We've done just about three hours. Oh, I think we have someone with it. Wait a minute. We have a. Yeah. Do, do we have a winner? Andrew Stryker. Well, Andrew. bring it over to me, please. Okay. So. Didn't he ask one of our questions, Angus? I can't recall at this moment. Okay. Uh, Angus Stryker, reply 10. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm gonna stop sharing and congratulate uh, Angus Stryker. So Angus, got the number right. There are 10 because there's six on the right, there's four on the left, and then in the middle there's two MEs, also ligature. So there are 10 TH ligatures. Now the, I, the interesting thing about that is, I will show you in another masterclass, that the entire cover of that that monument is literally a depiction of the layout of Solomon's temple. And the reason that there are 10 of those THs is because the, the TH, meaning I am that I am, do you remember? It came from the burning bush. 
the name of God is given to Moses from the burning bush. And the burning bush says to him, the divine in the burning bush says to him, Echye, Ache, Eche, I am that I am, which becomes Aleph, 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 which becomes Tov, 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 which becomes Tau, 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 which becomes Triple Tau, which becomes the three crosses on Calvary. The name of God is this symbol, at least in this particular Atbash cipher code. All right. Now, who knows that w the derivation of the menorah, where the menorah comes from, is actually a representation of the burning bush. So the menorah is the burning bush that delivers this name, this sacred name, Ehe Ashe Ehe. When you go into Solomon's temple, you go from between the two, the Boaz and the Yakin, which represent the, 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 the sun and the moon and life here in general, the me. I always think of them representing the me because they are the, the me, the self. You, you, you come through as yourself, but you're going through towards initiation to your higher self. So those two me's in the monument, that's where you enter. And then you've got this six and four, you've got 10 THs, 10 symbols of I am that I am, which are really 10 menorah. And in, the, in Solomon's temple, as you go into it, in the Hekal, after the pillars, there's 10 menorah. That's the layout. You go past 10 menorah and then into the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant is. The Devere. It's not, it's not the Ark of the Covenant, it's the Devere. The name of the Holy of Holies is the Devere. It's, it's, an, it's an astoundingly beautiful encryption. So I'm going to wind up with something that is a, a, an entirely new discovery, not fully fleshed out yet, because what I want to encourage you, I want to say again what I said last time, two weeks ago. Lots of people write to me w w with ideas that they've, that they've discovered something. And I, I just don't have the time to, 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 to get into it all uh, because otherwise I, you know, and obviously I'm doing what, what I do. Um, but sometimes I, 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 wish, I wish I did, but I just don't have all that time. But sometimes if it looks promising, I will just give it a nod and I'll have a look and I'll go, wow, this person's really onto something. And why not? We are all the divine. <laughs> we, we, we are all one, as Shakespeare tells us. It's all one. So uh, there's nothing special about discovering uh, codes. You just have to be pretty determined and, and dedicated and maybe, yeah, maybe have a certain knack for seeing patterns. Being a musician helps. I'm trained as a classical and then a jazz, jazz pianist. And, and as a, mu a musician, you see patterns on the fly. You could be playing and you, impro you start improvising. And of course you rely on certain things that you've done thousands and thousands of times. But all of a sudden somewhere from somewhere, something comes that is just, you go, oh, how did I do that? Where did that come from? No, it's as much a joy for the, for, for the player as it is for anyone in the audience experiencing it with you we're all one we the audience give you so much energy and so what i'm trying to convey here is if you have something uh, that you've sent to me send, send it to me again with a little note saying alan i really think you need to look at this and and, and i will look at it and uh, and if it if it seems to have any promise at all i'll put it up we're going to start a new section because we want to encourage this creativity and this discussion over finding things because it's everywhere when it all comes down to it da vinci hit a ton of stuff which you'll be hearing from from robert Ed, edward grant and myself when we're on together 
uh, in probably about a month's time. Um, I plan on having hopefully uh, another friend of mine on at some point. I, I will talk with him about it, so I won't name him and, and, and put him on the spot right now. But he's done a lot of work with Mozart and recognizing that Mozart put the ma mathematical codes into his, into his music particularly into the magic flute, which is known to have Freemasonic references. Um, Debussy, the same thing. Um, sculptors. Michelangelo, specifically. You know, the, these great ones come with insight, and they can't help but try to give you the deeper, deeper meaning from their heart and from their intellectual understanding of what is behind it as well. And that some, in, in, in some means, things that seem impossible for, for, for us, for them to know. So they're either really, really uh, advanced souls. I won't say special souls because there are no special souls, right? We're all the same being. Just that some of us are in kindergarten, some of us are in high school, some are in university. Right, well in school. So anyway, that's my plea to you. Send send the stuff, and we'll start a portion of the site where it's for things for you to share and get some exposure and say, oh look, you know, so and so found this, and then maybe it will spark interest from someone else. Someone else will connect with it and go, yeah, yeah, I've done research on that too, because the big surprise is that. We're, that there's people all over the world doing this, and they, they're unsung heroes and heroines. We don't know about them. So that's going to be a definite part of our uh, website coming up. So, made a new friend a couple of weeks ago, Ryan Seven in England, who had sent me something about the Sator Square. Now, I had come across the Sator Square, I, I knew quite a bit about it, uh, but I just love this guy, and he's from Manchester, where I'm from, and he's a young guy with lots of passion for his, for, and lots of humor, and he's doing a lot of brilliant stuff. I highly recommend you look him up uh, on it. Uh, just, just do Ryan7, seven, R-Y-A-N, 7, S-E-V-E-N, because I can't recall off the top of my head what the name of, of his site is, but you'll find it. And so he sent me something, and I want to share this with you because uh, not not what he sent, but what what it then triggered me. And it, it uh, first, some of these things start out like a, a detour. You go, I don't know what this is about, but I really sense there's something important here. And I did a lot of work on it, and I knew that there's, there's something about the Sator Square that I'd forgotten. You know, it was years ago. I went. Oh, I, I put it on the back burner. So, but the talk about how synchronous the universe is, because after working on this for just a couple of days, and I really shouldn't have been working on it because I thought I've got so much to do. There's no point in my trying to do all of this. This is ridiculous. But I just knew that I had to because I knew it was leading somewhere. Um, and so this is unfinished, but I'd like your comments on it. But what I want to convey to you is the magic of how this turns into something so much bigger. After working on this whole thing and the center line of the Sator Square, a movie comes out, right? So... Hold that thought, think what that movie might be. So I'm going to play a little game of um, Cosmic Scrabble. Now, I don't know how they play Scrabble out in the cosmos, but I would imagine they do it pretty, way, pretty much the way we do. They, they pick seven letters from a bag at random. So uh, let's just assume they, they draw these letters. But I'm going to just guess that because based on what this whole thing is about, I'm going to guess that you take those and you sort of jumble them out. Step, strep, strep throat, can I use that? Pest, 
Pace, yeah, pace. No, uh, rest. Nap rest. I need a nap. Yes. C can I use that? No, you can't use that. All right. Rent, rent. Parent. Pa oh, parents. Got it. I got a word. Got a whole word. Parents. Anyway, you might, in this cosmic Scrabble game, you might be allowed, I'm postulating, based on what they sent us, the, they're allowed to duplicate and, and their letters and say, well, any letter that you've got, you can take any, a certain number of multiples of them. I mean, obviously, I'm just setting this up. And you can buy a, a vowel. <laughs> right, I've just made up rules for my version of Cosmic Scrabble because obviously you know where this is going because I've preempted it by telling you. But that's my, just my way of setting it up to give you what is called the Sato Square. And the Sato Square is very special because you revolve it around and around and it's always going to be saying the same thing palindromically left to right and top to bottom. It says Setor, Arepo, Tenet, Opera, Rotas. And it says it top to bottom and it says Rotas top to bottom there and it says it along the bottom and no matter how you twist it around it's always going to say the same. So And people have wondered about this for a long time and said, well, what exactly is this? Because the earliest version of it that we've seen is in um, Pompeii, I believe, in AD 79, where there weren't a lot of Christians. But the central solution to this whole thing is that it spells out this wonderful cross, Paternoster, with Alpha Omega and Omega Alpha put out on its on the sides and so people have assumed that this is somehow an early christian symbolism and yet there's all kinds of evidence that say that it predates that predates christianity and particularly what attracted me was that ryan had, ryan seven had said he'd found a, a church in close to manchester where i am from uh, where there's a very very ancient uh, stone marker there with a Sator square on it. But Pater Noster is the Our Father, right? Pater Noster, Our Father, which is the Christian prayer or the Catholic prayer and the whole 30 years war that I'm talking about in the Fisher Kings series is centered around that. The reformers want to do away with the old rule. The, mold, the old mosaic laws don't apply to us anymore. They were from a different time. We want to be able to say the prayer in English. We want to read the Bible in English. The Catholics want us to just be kept distant because we are the gatekeepers and it, it must be sung in Latin and no one else who isn't educated can know about it. So that was, that was the big thing that started the whole, oh, you know, the whole problems with reformists and Catholics. So Peter Noster. Now, it's really interesting that in the gravestone, as I've just shown you, although I haven't shown you this part of it, we'll get into this in the next masterclass. John D, for he is the person who did this, has ligatured another two set of letters together besides the THs, a T and an E and an H and an E. The TE is, is the participle et, which is literally the way it's pronounced, et, and so it's written as et, but it, what it literally is, is the aleph and the tav, the beginning and the end, the alpha, the omega, the, the whole, both ends of the, the very uh, encoding that from, from which we get the I am that I am. And so he puts it in as et backwards, te, blessed with, with a te, uh, but he uses it, oh, dozens of times, all over, all kinds of codes. And so I know very well, this is a, a John D signature mark, T-E. And then he also has the H-E ligature together. H-E is the Hebrew letter He, which occurs twice in the name yod He vav He. So it's the name of God. And literally that Te and Et, backwards and forwards, mirror image, north and south, east and west, is, is central to the Seto Square. It literally means the beginning and end, the I am that I am. 
And also then in the gravestone, you have what I showed you, the THs and the triple tau, which are the triple tau and the fourth T, which we'll get into in the next masterclass. What is exactly that fourth T? What does that mean? So it's there in the Seto square, literally right in the center of it. And then another thing that John D does is he turns the N on its side and makes it into a, what we call in England a Z, but over here we call it a Z, N, Z, because the N looks very much like the Aleph, the Hebrew letter Aleph, and it turned on its side then becomes a Z. So what he's doing with this, well, and John D uses it, he's turning the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet into the last letter of the Roman alphabet. An Aleph, that looks like an N, turn on its side, becomes a Z. And I thought John D was the only person doing this because I found it in his codes everywhere. But then I, I realized it goes much, much deeper than that because it's actually a very ancient Catholic ritual. Here's a, a, an encoding that's used by the Templars, which shows the connection between the Greek alphabet and the Roman alphabet. And in those days, I and J were interchangeable and U and V were interchangeable. So there were only 24 letters, not 26, as we now have. And so those 24 match the 24 Greek letters. And thus the M and the N represent the alpha and the omega. And the alpha and the omega represent the A and the Z. And thus the, the Z on its side being the N is the same as the alpha and the omega. And that it bears itself out in this ancient ritual where you consecrate a church by putting these two alphabets crossing each other. This is actually happening in Westminster Abbey where they're consecrating the church. So they consecrate the floor this way with the two alphabets. And the rules for which they have to do it are written in this very special book where they tell you this is the way you do it. And they're showing you that literally the, the A to Z, the A to M is equivalent to the N, the A to the M and the N to the Omega and the A to the M and the N to the Z are equivalent. A to the M is the equivalent of the N to the Z, the A to the M and the N to the Omega, the Alpha Omega, they're all the equivalent. So the N is the A, the N is the Z. So it's not just D that's using it this way. I found this out years after I was discovering that D was using it. This N turned on its side is a Z. And so I find it very interesting that the Sator square has just this one N in the middle which of course gets turned on its side as you turn the square around and and yet it's still got this overall beautiful meaning and i thought well if however this was conveyed to us no one knows where it came from as i say the earliest version is around about 79 a.d but who knows if we might find this ultimately at gobekli tepe or tepe or wherever the thing is if that's the case, it probably goes much, much deeper. And I started to look at the corners and I thought, okay, well, are there, are there words here? Because the typical uh, solution is Sato represents Saturn. Aleppo is a farmer. They don't know. They just assume it's a farmer because there's no word Aleppo that means anything. Tenet is literally uh, hold or to, to hold or to take. Opera is the works and the rotas is the plow. But of course it has a much deeper meaning than that. That, that, that is all aiming towards the idea of the, uh, the plowman taking his, uh, the, the, the works of, of his, sweat of his brow. And the, but that's a, just a very mundane meaning. Really rotas has got to be about the whole rate, rotating of the uh, equinox, I believe. And so it's this bigger, deeper subject. And on a deeper level, it goes into, well, Saturn is really uh, this, this god who, whose wife was op op Opis, um, uh, from which is the base of the root of the word opera. 
and so and her wife his wife gave birth to all these kids and Saturn was jealous because he believed his children were going to overturn him sometime when they grew up and so Saturn ate all his children and so Opus came to the husband Saturn eventually when she gave birth to Jupiter and she wouldn't give him Jupiter she gave him instead a stone and of course, all this is some deeply embedded metaphysical and metaphorical meaning. It's not some god that ate his children. It's got this deeper meaning and ways for us to search it out. And what does it mean? But what, what would he eat as a stone in place of Jupiter? Jupiter then grows up to be uh, of age where he can uh, fight his father and get the, his siblings back out of the father's stomach. So that's as far as the meaning goes that everybody gives as a, as a representation. I'm suggesting it goes much deeper that these corners, uh, you see the word astra. What is astra in Latin? Well, it's a star and it has the astra form or it can be astre or it can be astro. So, and down here you have porto, and Porto is, <laughs> well, it's got a couple of different uh, variations, Porto or Porta. It means a passage, a way, a gate. It means I pierce, I traverse, to go, to traverse, to pass through, a means of passage. Porto, Porta, Latin, Porte. It's all there. On this right-hand side, you've got paro. Paro means to bring forth. I prepare. I prepare. And down here, aras. Aras is the altar or a sanctuary or a refuge. Um, <laughs> do you see where this is going? I mean, I just throw it open to you. This is, this is an unfinished work that I thought you might be interested in seeing because it's got, I mean, literally on the face of it, it is taking you to a far deeper level and it would not surprise me if this far deeper level were the truth, that this was literally what is Astro Porto. It's a stargate. Yes, <laughs> it's a portal. On the left-hand side, you have Pateo. I am open. What? I am open. The passageway is open from the Latin verb patens. And so if it's saying open, oh yeah, there it is, even in English, just in case you didn't get it. And you open it in the center, which is the center of the word tenet. And so by now you know that the movie I'm talking about that just came out. Stargate. Astra Porto. I prepare an altar. I am open through the Alpha Omega, through the et, the beginning and the end of the whole thing, the Pater Noster, the Our Father. So, <laughs> what is it, Pater Noster? is Rose T, Rose Tau. Rose Tau is the name of originally of Cairo, of where the pyramids are, Giza. Rose Tau is the original name of Giza. Ros Tau, Rose Cross, Rossi Crucians. That's where they get their name from. from Christian Rosenkreutz, Rosenkreutz. Christian Rosenkreutz and the Golden Stone from the Rosicrucian manifestos that came out in 1614, 1615, 1616, mostly attributed to John Dee and Francis Bacon. Who's Rosenkreutz? He's Christian Rosenkreutz, the, the putative leader of the original Rosicrucian movement, and in Chemical Wedding, he, he tells the story of going on this journey, this initiatory journey where he has to become a knight of the golden stone. 
Rosenkreutz becomes a knight of the Golden Star. Hamlet has Rosencrantz and Guildenstern show up out of nowhere and they are mysterious characters whose real intent is obviously to kill Hamlet on his way back to England and he turns the tables on them. It is deep stuff, man. Do you think the man from Stratford, whoever he was, and has, has our friend answered us on that? Has he told us who he is? Um, is essentially telling us that the, 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 a man from a country sticks like Stratford comes and knows knows these Rosicrucian secrets and writes about them. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, Rosenkreutz and the Golden Stone Knights. There's something to look into there, folks, because stone is really the philosopher's stone and Petra is a stone. Petra, it's stone, stone, stone cold evidence that this is far deeper than we think. It's the philosopher's stone, obviously. The geometry of the philosopher's stone, Rose Tau, the Rosicrucian movement. Now, what blew me away was not just sort of finding all this in that, but that literally two days after I'd worked on this, this movie Tenet comes out, the new Chris Nolan movie. <laughs> and what is it about? It's about reversing time. And he actually has the main protagonist in it is, is well, uh, the person called the protagonist is, is something else, but the main evil guy in it is played by Kenneth Branagh. And he's, he's called Sator. And then there's, uh, uh, I think, an arms dealer called Arapo. And then the, the, there's a whole thing that happens right at the very beginning. There's a terrorist attack in an opera house. And then later on, you see them go to a place that is a, is a company. It's called Rotas. So he's playing on this metaphor. He never explicitly goes to it. He never tells you it's the Sato Square. But the whole idea of Tenet coming backwards and forwards, it ends with a 10-minute scene. I'm giving you, I'm not giving you really giveaways here because no doubt it's all over the internet now anyway that the, these these details. I just wondered what you all thought of it because literally that's an example of synchronicity that just blows my mind. I didn't know this movie was coming out and it literally came out, it, the news came out about it like, oh, you can't see it because of COVID, but boy, when you see it, and I'm actually going to go see it on uh, Monday with Robert Edward Grant. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'll, uh, well, I've already seen it, obviously, as I told you, I'm seeing it for the second time because it's got all these references in it. And so interesting, huh? That's how they play Cosmic Scrabble. So my friends, I gotta say, um, it's coming up on 426, and I think that would be the absolute perfect time to say sayonara. So it's 424, I will just ask you one more time. Oh, for the person that won the book, I will be, please send us your physical address, your information, so we can be um, in touch and I can send you the book. And when you get it, take a selfie, would you? And send it to us so we can post you on, online on our, on our website and see you learning from it. In two weeks time, we have, as I say, the wonderful Adam Apollo, who will be, uh, absolutely blowing everyone's minds and um so from there we will we'll be taking it wherever it leads us robert edward grant will be coming up nasim haramain has agreed to be a guest at some future time and i for the weeks that i do not have a guest uh we'll be going deeper and deeper into this into these master classes in which I will try now, having covered a wide swath, I will try to just focus in on one particular area. So if you have any uh, particular wishes that you want to go a certain way, a certain direction, send them to me and I will be responsive. We will we'll, we'll say, okay, we'll have a particular masterclass on that if enough people are interested in it. Otherwise, I will just go and say that uh, I will keep on plowing ahead with as much of this as I can until you get the whole picture. Please check out the Fisher Kings because it is going somewhere so stunning. I honestly can tell you, you, will, you won't believe it when you see Act 3 come out. It's, it's, 
really mind blowing. It's been a pleasure sharing time with you. It is now four to six, and thus I am saying, God and Goddess, bless you all. See you next time.